Good afternoon, and welcome to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Uh, today thir is Thursday, June 20th, 2019. I am Council Member Ben Kalis. I have the privilege of chairing this committee. If you are watching at home or on the live stream, please feel free to participate. You can always tweet me at Ben Kalos if you are a member of the public or the press and you have ideas for me to submit, uh, for me to ask. Uh, we do it that way too. You can even email us. Um, I'd like to uh, thank our uh, task force leader for on MWBE in the council, uh, Councilmember Robert Cornegy, who, who does have legislation before uh, this committee, as well as Debbie Rose, who has a very important bill today that does a lot of the heavy lifting in response to the disparities report. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, this is the uh, disparities report. It's really cool. Who, who here, I just see a show of hands. How many folks have, have read the disparities report? Awesome, 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 thank you. Uh, and uh, it's, it compete, it's, it's it, the last document of this size that I read was the city charter. It, it's competitive in terms of how thrilling it can be. There's uh, fewer surprising things as you would find in the charter. Uh, I want to also uh, welcome, we have uh, Council Member Rosenthal who has legislation before the committee today, as well as Council Member Brannon, uh, and for their uh, continued support on MWB issues. The City Council has long supported the city's minority and women-owned businesses, and uh, through its various MWB initiatives, the Council has assisted MWBs in expanding their role in the both city procurement and private sector. A and just to make this clear and very plain language, the city has a $92 billion budget, and this is just about making sure that um, we stand up to racial uh, disparities and, and uh, prejudice that MWBEs or, or just minorities and women face in the private marketplace. And so under the 14th Amendment, uh, and it's cool to get to wax constitutional as a lawyer every now and then, uh, there's the Equal Protection Clause and there's strict scrutiny any time uh, there is anything related to race to base, anything in legislative law, but where there is a history and there can be shown and uh, that there is a pattern of discrimination that we are trying to offset, uh, that is when the City Council can do something about it. And so uh, this disparity study is actually mandated by the United States Constitution and the 14th Amendment and allows us to do the work that we are doing. In 2005, the city established its MWB program in order to address the disparities in city procurement between the number of minority and, and women-owned businesses available to do business with the city and the number that are actually awarded city contracts. We on the council applaud the work being done by the Department of Small Businesses Services uh, led by Greg Bishop and uh, as well as uh, the My Mayor's Office of MWBEs by uh, Janelle Doris. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but you have the same last name as one of my favorite city agencies. And the SBS Commissioner gets the gold star for being the only other government nerd. The, uh, <laughs> Agency is called the Department of Records and Information Services, and it is fondly referred to as Doris. Uh, so uh, there you go. Um, and I want to thank you for uh, coming to testify today. In fiscal year 2018, uh, which ended on June 30th of last year, the contract's budget was $19.8 billion with a B. Of this, only $5.3 billion of these contracts were subject to the MWBE program. And of that, only 16%, roughly $835 million, was actually awarded to MWBE prime contractors. When MWBE subcontractors are included in that analysis, the number is still only around 19% of all eligible contracts as of June 2018. This falls short of the mayor's stated goal of achieving 30% MWB utilization. And just to be clear, according to the census in the city of New York, I, as a male, am in the minority. Uh, I, I think that's actually a good thing for my prospects, but 51% um, of our city is women. 
And so if women had equal representation in the marketplace, we shouldn't even be talking about 30%. We should be talking about over 50%. And then when you add in the fact that minority groups and women hit around 51 to 53% according to the disparity study, um, it's a huge concern for me that it's only at 19%. And this is, again, 19% of a percent of a percent, and we're talking about less than a billion dollars instead of, and, and forgive me for talking about the 19.8 billion, but like we should be talking about 94, 93 billion dollars, which we just passed. Each of the bills before the committee today is designed in its own way to improve access to city procurement for MWB vendors, and look forward to discussing these bills with the administration and the public this afternoon. The uh, bill that I am, uh, I, if I'm not already signed on, please sign me on as a sponsor. Is introduction 1293A, sponsored by Council Member Debbie Rose. It would update the definitions of minority group for the purposes of MWBE programs to include Native American-owned firms and would also right-size the citywide MWB program with goals to be consistent with the most recent disparity findings relating to the distribution amongst uh, different racial and ethnic groups. Uh, I want to thank Debbie for carrying this bill. It does a lot of the heavy work. I will get to you soon for your opening statement. Uh, intro 1452, uh, sponsored by Councilmember Robert Cornegie, who is chairing our MW Task Force, would require more frequent updates to operational protocols in the city's MWB program from the city's chief procurement officer and the mayor's office of MWBE. Um, and I think I will note that both of these legislations were introduced at, by request of the mayor. So we want to thank the mayor for his leadership on this, and we hope to have supportive testimony on at least these bills. Uh, introduction 346, sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, as well as Intro 1379. The first would require the city controller to conduct annual audits focused solely on MWBE procurement and would require the city contractors to hire an independent MWB consultants for contracts over $10 million. We're also hearing two pre-considered bills today. The first, sponsored by Councilmember Justin Brannon, would require agencies to use the most recent data available when considering revisions to the citywide MWB participation goals. Uh, that's because as we were looking through this study published in 2018, uh, the number that was actually cited in is 2017, and then a lot of the data in it actually goes further back, um, and so we want to make sure that when this comes out, it's as accurate as possible with detail, with data as recent as possible. So I want to thank our uh, Justin Brannon uh, for that. And uh, give me one moment. Uh, there's a second pre-considered bill before the committee, uh, which. Uh, has anyone here ever read the MMR? So it's the, the Mayor's Management Report. It is one of my favorite books that comes out from the city every year. Uh, and it comes out uh, twice a year. There's a preliminary Mayor's Management Report and a uh, Mayor's Management Report that comes out in September in that it really goes through the indicators, how we track things. And even better than the MMR is something called the CPR. Who here knows about the CPR? NYC.gov slash CPR, and it gives you live, up-to-date tracking on this MMR, which is this uh, semi-annual report. Uh, I, I used to be GovOps chair. This is like the stuff I love. Uh, and so we took inspiration from that and the fact that so much of the data that's happening, especially with Passport, is going to be live data. And the concept of why are we still focused on doing a report every two years where we can put the indicators into a query and just have that query coming out and create dashboards. So the idea behind my pre-considered legislation is for as people are registering and becoming MWBEs for that to be reflected and I'm hoping to have a conversation with you uh, about just the A version as we were doing the pre-considered about how do we make sure that we're also keeping live track as Passport becomes better and better of how close we are to matching those goals so that on a daily basis and then quarterly or whatever we think is feasible people can actually see how are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis and use that for uh, managing. Uh, 
Uh, we on the committee believe this package of bills is likely to spark a lively debate, and we hope the hearing will help overcome some of the roadblocks to MWB procurement by identifying ways the administration can improve its process and get to 30% utilization citywide that the mayor has set. I hope to convince him to get to 50%. Uh, before I turn the floor over to other sponsors to discuss those bills, I'd like uh, to take a moment to acknowledge that we're joined by Council Member uh, Bill Perkins, uh, and I want to apologize that I was late and uh, both of us had governmental operations contemporaneous with this committee, so that is why we had to come over. Um, and uh, I've already acknowledged two of the additional members who are here. I'd also like to thank the uh, staff. They've been doing this for, I think, longer than uh, uh, many of us at this table have been in the City Council. Uh, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Casey Addison, Finance Analyst Andrew Wilborn, Finance Unit Head John Russell, as well as Chief my Chief of Staff Jesse Towson, Legislative Director Wilfredo Lopez, uh, for all their hard work putting this hearing together. Um, it's funny, I rarely thank my staff, and I've always said to them, if you want to be thanked, just add yourself to the talking points, and they finally did it, but it took them five and a half years. Uh, I'd like to now turn over the floor to Council Member Rose to discuss proposed introduction 1238A. Thank you, Chair Kalos, and um, I'm going to see if I can get you the New York Times reading lists for some summer reading other than MMR and CBR. <laughs> 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 I want to, um, but I want to begin by thanking you. I, I want to thank you um, so much uh, for expediting this hearing. Um, I, I know it, it was a while getting it together, and um, and I, I want to thank you for agreeing to hear this this uh, this bill um, so quickly. So um, thank you and. Um, our small businesses collectively employ more than 3.9 million people in the city. And while many of them are minority and women owned, they have historically struggled with participation in city contracting. Our city has made an attempt to correct these disparities with outreach and procurement goals for minority and women owned business enterprises or MWBEs. It came to my attention that this program contained a glaring omission. Our nation has a dark and checkered past regarding the treatment of members of Native American tribes. Centuries of genocide, forced removals, and other deplorable acts of violence and discrimination have left us a shameful legacy, resulting in higher rates of poverty and unemployment among members of Native American tribes compared to the general population. And yet members of the Native American tribes have not been included in our MWBE outreach. Intro 1293 will remedy this omission and add Native American to the list of business owner categories who can register as an MWBE in New York City. It is a small but significant step toward righting the past wrongs. This bill will very importantly also address the updated citywide procurement goals for all historically underrepresented groups across procurement categories in, a, in accordance with the findings from the 2018 citywide disparity study. And, and I'm really glad that we've gotten to, to this level. I want to give special thanks to the constituent who brought this issue to me and has advocated for this bill, Jacqueline Takaranti. She is here with us today and will be testifying in support of the bill. I want to thank again Chair Kalos. And I want to thank also Mayor de Blasio and SBS Commissioner Greg Bishop for recognizing this omission and proposing solutions. Speaker Corey Johnson, who is a big supporter of anything that improves the quality of life for all New Yorkers, I want to thank him for his support of this legislation and, um, and my co-sponsor, Council Member Robert Cornegy and Daniel Collins, who has worked on bringing this legislation to life. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Inez Barron, uh, who has been an outspoken, has been in this council outspoken uh, on these issues and issues of recognizing our city's uh, past as it relates to people of color. And I want to thank her for being a champion. 
Uh, we have additional opening statements, but I'm going to just ask. I see a lot of people in the audience, and so far we have six people signed up to speak. Uh, so this is the appearance card. You can get it from the sergeant at arms. Uh, if you haven't filled one out, please make sure to do so. Uh, if you have remarks, please make sure they are written. If you don't have written remarks, do your best to try to write some of them down. Uh, you are free to just get up and give testimony. We'll take it. And uh, last but not least, uh, if you're watching at home uh, and it is uh, the right now or within a couple of days of the 20th of June in 2019, uh, you can actually submit your testimony. You can email it into us within 72 hours uh, of this hearing, and you can email us at contracts at bencalos.com. Uh, we want to make sure everyone has their voice heard and is able to participate wherever and whenever they wish. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Council Member Helen Rosenthal for an opening statement. Thank you. I'm actually going to pass. I'm anxious to hear from the audience and from the administration. Really glad that we're doing this hearing. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, now we are, we are joined by Greg Bishop from Department of Small Business Services, Janelle Doris, Director of MWBE for the Mayor's Office. Uh, 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 D. Kunan from Mox and uh, Ryan Murray um, from Mox. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Mox needs to work on penmanship. But, uh, <laughs> that, that being said, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I now ask the committee council to swear you in. Would you all please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Great, thank you. You may begin. Test it. Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, um, Chair Kalos and members of the council. Committee on Contracts. My name is John L. Doris, and I'm the Senior Advisor and Director of the Mayor's Office of MWBE. Today I will provide an overview of the citywide MWBE program, including the progress made toward our MWBE certification and utilization goals set by this administration. With me today are Greg Bishop, the Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services, and Ryan Murray, First Deputy Director at MOX, and G. Kwan. Deputy Director of Strategic Initiatives of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services to answer questions that you may have uh, specific to their agencies. In the fall of 2016, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the creation of the Mayor's Office of MWBEs as a critical next step in the administration's commitment to increasing contract and opportunities for minority and women entrepreneurs. The mayor pledged ambitious goals, achieving 30% MWBE utilization by the end of 2021 and having 9,000 city certified MWBEs by the end of 2019. In 2015, the mayor outlined a separate citywide goal to award 16 billion to minority and women owned businesses over the next 10 years. This one NYC goal, the 30% goal, covers both mayoral and non-mayoral agencies on the heels of the May 2018 disparity study, the mayor announced that we were $1.8 billion ahead of schedule on our one NYC goal and decided to increase that goal from $16 billion to $20 billion. Under the leadership and bold vision of Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson, whose uh, career-long justice and equity work includes increased in economic development opportunities by calling out the challenges, structural and historical barriers in the marketplace within government, we have doubled down on our commitment to our MWBE goals and more than approach, I'm sorry, more than ever approach them through the broad lenses of economic democracy and equity. Under the supervision of the Deputy Mayor, SBS, and MOX also play an integral role in implementing the MWBE program. SBS certifies MWBEs and provides essential capacity building services and technical assistance to ensure they can compete for, the, for and execute city contracts. MOX tracks and reports on utilization data for the city uh, subject to Local Law 1. The purpose of the city's MWB program is to remedy the impact of discrimination in the market 
where the city makes its procurements. This uh, impact is statistically analyzed in a disparity study. The latest disparity study published in May 2018 demonstrated that based on the availability of MWBEs or minority women owned firms in the city's marketplace, they are underutilized in city procurement. The MWB goals set out in, this, in the legislation before this committee today are supported by the findings of the recent study. Along with my colleagues here today, my office will continue to play a strategic role in ensuring the city's agencies remain focused on achieving the goals of the program. Since the start of the administration, the number of certified firms have increased by 86 uh, percent, thanks to the good work of uh, Commissioner Bishop and his team. As of the close of fiscal year 18, the number of certified firms were at 6,829. Additionally, at the end of fiscal year 18, Mox reported the MWB utilization to be 19 percent, representing 1.069 billion in awards toward MWBEs of the city's contract under Local Law 1. As compared to the 8 percent, or $465 million, value of city contracts in fiscal year 15 at the start of the administration. The preliminary fiscal year 19 Q1 to Q3 data reflects a 24 percent MWBE utilization and a one NYC value of over 11 billion. We are also very happy to report that since 2015 our, t our over 10 billion has been awarded to MWBEs by both mayoral and non-mayoral agencies uh, pursuant to the one NYC goal. The city has implemented a number of creative initiatives to help build MWBE capacity and obtain capital. We have also advocated at the state for legislative initiatives that give the city the MWBE certified under our law parity with respect to powers and benefits applicable to the state MWBE uh, law. Pursuant to Local Law 1 and the goals therein, the percentage of dollars awarded to MWBE subject to the city's program has trended up from 8% in 2015 to nearly 20 percent in fiscal year 18. Just to put this in perspective, at the close of fiscal year 18, we, are, we were proud to report that we are doing this in record time. The city is closing in on its, a 30 percent goal, which we, may, which we know we can achieve by 2021. Still, we have more to do. We are lowering and, wherever possible, removing structural barriers to enter in the city's procurement marketplace by providing resources for increased programming at city agencies and creating strategic initiatives to increase MWBE's ability to compete successfully. In accordance with the four core principles of our program accountability, accessibility, capacity building, and sustainability, we have implemented initiatives to address issues MWBE's face in the marketplace, namely access to capital, uh, which is the common obstacle of many small and mid-sized firms. In order to respond to this need, the administration has launched the Contract Finance Loan Fund and Bond Collateral Assistance Fund, both administered by SBS and the Emerging Developer Loan Fund administered by EDC. Together, the initial investment from the administration across these funds was $30 million. As you may know, the mayor also convened the city depository banks to begin a discussion about partnership to increase uh, and create accessible capital for MWBEs and small businesses in New York City. On February 21st, 2018, we announced that three of those banks had made the commitment to invest in the city's MWBE to the tune of $40 million. Since then, we have raised an additional million dollars from another city depository bank, bringing the total amount of capital invested in our program to $71 million. In the spring of 2017, we are joined by many MWBEs, advocates, and stakeholders, including the city's agencies and calling for the passage of S6513 and A8505, the bill proposed increase the discretionary spending limit for goods and services purchased to MWBEs and given the city the authority uh, already provided to the state to offer MWBEs a price or points preference. The bill passed overwhelmingly in the Senate, in the Assembly and Senate, and for that we are thankful to our elected officials, including the council members here today who supported us on that bill. The change provide, pro, th this change, sorry, provides MWBEs with access to more and larger contracts to help build capacity and succeed as prime contractors. The discretionary threshold for goods and purchases was implemented on March 5, 2018, and by quarter three of this year, under this increased threshold, 
Roughly 900 contracts were awarded to MWBEs in the amount of 68 million. In fact, yesterday, through collaborative effort, and I'm happy to announce today, uh, collaborative effort with our MWB advocates and the city, the state legislature passed the bill S64188A8407 that would allow uh, the city's MWB program to gain even more parity with the state's MWBE program. That will provide greater opportunities and key tools for New York City MWBEs. New York City MWBEs will now, once the governor signs the bill, have the benefit uh, of up to 500,000 in discretionary threshold for goods and services and construction contracts uh, with the city agencies. They will also benefit from a pre-qualified list of agencies and a mentorship program to be established at the city uh, Department of Design and Construction. Uh, we're just we're just very excited about this. <laughs> I, I, I know you can see my uh, excitement. I could barely get through this here. Uh, but this is the first time I'm publicly saying this, so we are very excited uh, that we were able to do that. Many of the advocates in this room and the MWBs in this room went up to, uh, with us to Albany to advocate for that bill, and we are so entirely grateful. Uh, and now on to when this, once the governor signs, we'll be able to implement it. Um, this mentorship program previously uh, this mentorship program is also at SCA and the MTA, and now we can actually have it at the city DDC's uh, design and construction uh, agency. These authorities and programs have been successful and are, are the basis of what we're doing at DDC, and so we're very grateful uh, to the legislator for passing that. Uh, on today's council bills, we support Bill Intro 1293, sponsored by Council Member Rose which would update citywide procurement goals for all minority groups across um, groups in all industries, uh, classification of MWB program. We will also sub, uh, support bill introduction 1452, sponsored by Council Member Cornegy, and we are extremely proud to be working with the council. Uh, regarding bill intro 1379, sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal, uh, would require an independent MWB consultant for every city contract value over 10 million, especially for larger contracts. There are significant potential benefits to this idea, and we look forward to further conversations with the council to work through the details of that bill. As it relates to bill intro 346, sponsored by council member Rosenthal, which would require an annual audit of procurements uh, from the form MWBs by the controller, while we agree with the goals of the transparency uh, we would defer to the controller and the council person, uh, council member on this particular bill as of now. Uh, yesterday, two pre-considered bill related to data, LS10225, sponsored by council member Brannon, and LS11187, sponsored by council member and our chair, Kalos, uh, were added to the hearing agenda uh, while we while we will need more time to fully review the legislation, we share the value of transparency and look forward to further uh, dialogue with the sponsors of those bills. Um, looking ahead with the new tools gained in Albany this session, we anticipate significantly more awards going to MWBEs. Uh, we will continue onward in pursuit of our goals and in our continued advocacy for MWBEs and promoting diversity and equity in the city's marketplace. Going forward, we will continue to work closely with the council and our elected partners on MWBE outreach, networking, and educational uh, events. We will also continue to meet regularly with interested council members uh, to share updates on the program's milestones. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and your continued support and advocacy for our program. We would be happy to answer any questions you may have today. Thank you. Sounds like a lot of good news, uh, especially in your testimony regarding getting from 19% to jumping five percentage points to 24% in quarters uh, one through Q3 of FY19, uh, which is not data that we had access to. Uh, is that inclusive of both prime and subcontractors or not? It is. Okay. Uh, do you have the number for prime contractors only? We are at 18% for prime contractors only. 
through um, quarter three, that's our point nine million dollars. So that's about two percent additional. So it's it's still an increase. We're still headed in the right direction. Yeah. And versus nineteen percent, which is when you consider them together. Uh, so sub. So that mean what was the uptick in the subcontractors? So our subcontractor utilization increased to sixty percent. So we 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 had record. Uh, achievement in our subcontractor utilization, and we had 18% in our prime contractor utilization, and combined, based on the calculations that we do to calculate utilization, it comes to 24%. Okay, great. Uh, and so it sounds like you're really excited about what happened in Albany. Uh, Absolutely. Had it, so if you're already at 24%, even without Albany, and hopefully we're already on track to hit 30%, uh, how does this change things? Does the, how soon do we hit 30% with the new change in Albany? Do you, have you already done the numbers to look at how many of the contracts were at that 500,000 threshold? Yeah, we've done the numbers. Uh, you know, we're, we're confident we will get to 30% in 2021, and that's our commitment, and we will continue to push to that. Uh, not, not to move the field goals, which I've been told is a thing because I don't play sports, but uh, the, the mayor has on occasion moved his own field goal, like on the affordable housing plan. He said he started with, I think, 180,000, and now he said 300. Uh, you're hitting your numbers. 2021 is pretty far away. Uh, would you be open to reconsidering and setting a more aggressive goal sooner? And, you know, we really feel that 30% is an aggressive goal based upon the current structure and the current market um, with the current tools we have. And as we gain more tools, I think we will have the ability to reassess. But at this time, we are confident first that we've got to get the 30% uh, goal before we make an adjustment. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, but yes. Uh, commissioners. So uh, I, I appreciate your, your excitement as well. But just to remind people, the governor has not signed this. So... If he has not signed it, we cannot even implement. So let's get the governor to sign it first, and then we can then talk about implementation after. Okay. Uh, so in the disparity study on uh, page 6-2, which is not actually page 6, it's actually like page 60-something, um, there's recommendation D relating to disparities in the private sector. Uh, and... Um, I'm sorry, that is not the right section. Uh, it is six dash, give me one second, sorry. Sorry, in the executive summary at six dash, oh, it was in the, we'll find it, it's a big document. Sorry for misplacing it. Uh, within the executive summary, uh, recommendation D, and the disparity study uh, in, uh, s made a recommendation for tracking uh, compliance uh, and ostensibly through passport uh, in real time, which is something we're trying to capture with our legislation. How is the city planning to implement uh, the second bullet in recommendation D? Uh, uh, implement an online tracking compliance information management system to notify subcontractors when payments are made for primes and verified payments, which would be, give us in a position where we could actually track where we are on a payment by payment basis. Hi, Chair. As you know, Ryan Murray from Mox. As you know, we are still in the design process for uh, phase three of Passport, where we're looking at uh, citywide invoicing specific to these types of contracts. Uh, but we will have the ability um, with tracking subs in Passport uh, and having alerts in place to actually send out notifications uh, in the system. So that's one capability that exists. So that's already in existence in Phase 2? Uh, for So Phase 2 is specific to the goods contracts, which are different. Okay. Um, but Phase 3, when we're looking at invoicing uh, over the course of the, the implementation period for that time, uh, we're looking at making sure that we utilize those alerts. We and do have alerts right now that are used in the system citywide, um, and those are available to uh, any contractor so that they know when disbursements happen. 
And that, when is phase three due to be completed and delivered and live? Uh, we are tracking right now for phase three to be next uh, spring, so around uh, about a year after when we launch, so sometime in the early spring next year. Okay, and so, and that will allow us to keep track of when the prime gets paid and when the subcontractors get paid and whether the subcontractors that have been selected are getting paid are tagged as MWBs and you'll be able to pull a report. All right, we're designing all those features now, but the capability will exist. Um, and as, as you know, we have phased implementation. So uh, throughout the course of the launch period, yes, we will have capability to make sure that folks uh, are alerted. That's we're tracking for that. I think agile development is a good thing as a agile developer. Um, and so the, the pre-considered legislation we put in that you didn't have a chance to really dig into too much would basically take that reporting information that you have, and as you know, I've asked for a passport account myself, but I'm oh, well. still, still struggling to get that, but to have a public-facing uh, export and dashboard and report on that. So is that something that is feasible within what you're planned for phase three? For phase three, and we're always looking at anything that can be exported to open data, which I think is also one of your, the goals that we share. Um, that is a goal for us. I think uh, on the dashboard side, when we last met with you at our office, we talked about uh, reporting a reporting portal uh, for ours that will be available to executives and agencies. Um, and I think we are actively looking at how to make sure that you are provisioned. But the biggest thing that we can do here is make sure that data uh, is sent out uh, to the open data. Uh, I should note that uh, currently you're able to, any contractor, look at FMS to see when payments are going out uh, to, to Prime, so that already exists. But yes, we are tracking to make sure that we pr the, uh, the data, data is exportable. Is there a process to verify that a ba business is capable? Uh, sorry, um, along those lines, some MWBE subcontractors ha said prime contractors um, are slow in their payments. They've also said that sometimes they'll get dropped after the winning bid and subcontractor with a different non-MWBE firm, which is counter the spirit of the program. Have you heard of this? Uh, how have you handled it if you have? And are there consequences for uh, primes that engage in this bait and switch? So uh, I think in one of the challenges that we do face, Council Member, as in a program, and sort of all MWBs programs, is really holding our prime contractors really accountable for their MWBE utilization, um, even in this process. And so we've heard of that in some instances um, where in public forums, um, MWBs might mention uh, they were a part of a bid and you know, they didn't uh, end up working on that project. I think part of s what we've implemented uh, in the city and what we're looking to increase on, this is where some of the tools, the electronic tools we're talking about is going to be helpful, is that, you know, m more transparency into that process and to figure out, you know, when, when prime contractors do come to us with a, uh, with a um, utilization plan, that the agencies are holding them accountable to that utilization plan. Uh, part of our uh, job is to hold those agencies accountable to the processes that they already have. And so while this is not something we hear uh, on a consistent basis, but in open forums we've heard that MWBEs uh, did bid on a project with a prime and didn't really get work from that. Uh, you know, part of what we are here to do is to be a one-stop shop for our MWBEs. And they do come, they do speak to us about some of the concerns they have, and we're looking to rectify even these types of concerns. And we just want to remind everybody also that the contract is a legal binding document. And so um, if a prime contractor is not uh, doing what they have said to the city and also what relationships they have, uh, have with the subcontractors that they've communicated to us, uh, we at an agencies will hold them accountable for you heard it here first, so if you're a subcontractor, particularly an MWBE that finds yourself uh, dropped uh, for, for one reason or another, but that does not seem to be legitimate, please feel free to reach out to the mayor's office and uh, you can email our committee, contracts at bencalis.com and we will look forward to working with the mayor's office to force people to follow the contracts that they signed with the city.
That is really good news. This, is, this has been a lot of good news. Thank you. Uh, with regard to um, the business directories maintained by uh, SBS, uh, one of the questions that has been brought to us is uh, that sometimes somebody might check a box to get a vendor that they think is qualified at something and they might not get somebody. So somebody might say, well, I do. They, they might check a box that says they can qualify to do one type of work and then they'll spend the time calling through the folks in the in the database only to find out that they didn't actually have the expertise that they had checked in the box. Uh, is this accurate? Um, I, I may want to make sure I'm hearing from both sides of the story. Is this something that happens? Uh, and is there a method to indicate the levels of expertise a business might have, such as licensing or certification? Uh, and if it isn't currently there, is it something that will be integrated into phase three of Passport? So um, our online directory, which is available at nyc.gov slash buy certified for all the prime contractors who always say they can't find an MWBE. Can you, um, can you give that link one so more time? NYC.gov slash buy certified. Um, we, uh, obviously we are uh, at Small Business Services, we are the agency uh, that populates that list um, once, an agent, once a, a company gets certified. Um, we try as, as much as possible to make sure that all the information that's on the online directory is up to date and accurate. Um, it is possible um, because our certification period is for five years uh, that a company that was certified maybe two or three years ago may have changed their business um, uh, capabilities. Um, we, uh, on a yearly basis, we connect with companies to up and we try to get them to update their records. Uh, we've invested in uh, reaching out to companies, uh, ensuring their NIGB code uh, correctly matches what they currently do uh, to make sure that uh, they're most on the uh, on a on a business profile. What um, anyone that's looking to connect with the MWB will see is their top three largest contracts. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the type of work and their capacity and what they do, um, and then their codes, uh, which gives you a further uh, idea of uh, the work that they do. Um, we have worked with industry uh, organizations who've talked about uh, how we can actually fine tune that um, uh, that list, and we added like bonding uh, uh, capacity uh, to the directory, uh, and we've also ad added uh, some other things that they can search for. Um, we are happy to continue uh, fine tuning what uh, individuals can search on. Uh, we continue to look at ways we can make it as real time as possible. Uh, so happy to work with your office and with any other advocates in terms of what other uh, uh, challenges are there. We've heard about um, uh, some of the licensing. At the end of the day, it is up to um, the either prime contractor or the agency to uh, look at the MWBE to ensure that they do have uh, the uh, prerequisites to operate on the job. The online directory is just a start in terms of being able to actually connect uh, to those companies. Thank you for being transparent, open, and honest about it. So I guess the question is, uh, could this be something that could be, is Passport something that could be helpful, or is it a situation of having SBS work with your folks? And I guess the, do you have your technical folks here today, or what were the technical, will be the technical folks? So I guess just um, perhaps throwing an, an application program interface but an API that will talk to DCA and the other agencies so that the person just puts in their license number, it does the lookup automatically, and then when it expires, it tells your system it's expired, and then it can send a message to the vendor to say, hey, you're, you're expired, and you should remember, and, and the agency should be doing it anyway, but right. just trying to add a little bit of intelligence so it's a little bit more than a form and it also might save you some staff time because it sounds like you're spending considerable time following up with people to say, hey, you filled this out three years ago. Are there other things you want to update? Maybe you have new experience, different things. I, I would be totally happy to work with you. I, so I, I smile because I think uh, you and I are probably the only computer science nerds in the room, um, but totally get what you're talking about in terms of uh, we are trying to accomplish this on the business side through nyc.gov slash business where we do have data exchanges and we do have um, information from different agencies for small businesses who are actually 
uh, permitting with the city so they can see uh, a global view of all their interactions with different agencies. I think what you just talked about is an interesting idea in terms of how we can get our online directory to be much smarter uh, and connect to other agencies. It is, it's, it's a simple concept, but it's, it, hard. It's, it's hard work and it costs a lot of money, but I'd be happy to uh, work with you to figure out where we, we can get some funding and, and hash out the ideas to make sure that all our systems are talking to each other. I will, I will code pair with you any day. Uh, <laughs> we should talk about which programming language and settle, but I'm a LAMP stack kind of guy on the open source. <laughs> on the Passport side, so I, you know, the, as the commissioner shared, uh, the online directory will remain. Uh, we currently pull in uh, the file from uh, our financial management system that basically says whether or not uh, their MWBE group. Uh, the thing that we are contributing to this, I think, to make it easier to find vendors uh, who actually have certain sort uh, who have who are uh, in a certain category. So the codes and finding the right codes. I think many of the vendors here can tell you it's a little hard sometimes to figure out which one to pick, uh, or they pick a whole set and then they, they get solicitations that aren't relevant. So uh, one of the projects that we did in human services and we will do. Uh, that we're undertaking now, and we've engaged some uh, of the vendors here in the, the groups, is a taxonomy project. So if we're going to be nerding out a little bit more, uh, really the classification system. So the underlying classification system will remain, but the hierarchy that we place on top of that so it's easier to describe what you do and get to the right codes, I think would help uh, both on the agency side and the vendor side figure out uh, if they're making the right selections. I think, uh, as the commissioner shared, uh, the do you have the right license and making sure that process is, is uh, more robust, we, we can continue to collaborate on that. But online directory will be separate. We'll be making sure that the classification system on top of the codes that don't make sense uh, are updated. In five and a half years, five and a half years, you were the first folks to mention the word taxonomy to me at a hearing. <laughs> I'm very happy. Uh, I'm gonna, I have one last line of questions and I wanna turn it over to Councilmember Rose, followed by Barron, followed by Rosenthal. Uh, you keep mentioning money. Apparently that's a thing that folks need to do a lot of the work, even get some of it done. Um, and so you mentioned uh, some pretty great news relating to some of the funds that you have, uh, that it was at $30 million and you've been able to work with the depository banks to do another $40 million, at adding a last million dollars, getting that uh, up to $71 million. Uh, what are the names of the banks? If somebody is watching at home and wants some of this $71 million, which bank should they be going to? Is it on the corner? Where do I find these banks? Uh, along those lines, I'm curious to know how many certified MWB have received loans from these programs? What criteria is required to be eligible? Uh, do they have to be certified to get this money? Um, and how much has actually been allocated? How, what's the utilization rate? Uh, do you have any examples? And, um, and just if you could tell us how you convinced the depository banks to throw $40 million out there, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, so I, um, I, I don't know if I, I'll, I'll just answer and if I hope I get to best. everything and if not then you can certainly ask again um, so you know when we talk about access to capital um, and, and I'll just take a break here and from from my current role and just go back to when I was a small business owner and went to a, a bank right and asked for a loan and was denied even though I had everything in line. What, what did you what was your small business? Well we were, the, we were a consulting firm okay and so in business development uh, consulting firm and so part of the challenge uh, was not that we had the business or not, but certainly it was the, 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 the interest rate that we had. And so uh, our interest rate is at 3%, and we capped that, and we're very proud of that. Um, okay, and that since, uh, okay, and since, um, since the inception of the, the program, um, for the contract finance loan fund, which is 3%, you can get up to 500,000 per loan, but a million dollars, up to a million dollar total over a calendar year if it's needed. Um, we've done 64 loans, totaling $11.1 million in that program alone um, in the first year or so, a little over that. Um, for the bond collateral assistance program, which gives MWBEs who are seeking bond assistance um, up to, again, half a million collateral. So you need collateral to get the bond. And sometimes folks put up their personal 
assets, their you know, uh, their home, etc., all that, which is something that is uh, uh, we don't uh, advise uh, if if possible. And so we saw that that was a need, and certainly we have a ten million dollars in that fund, um, and we've put out about eight, uh, two awards, so eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. As we had sixty four applicants also assisted through this program um, on the. EDC um, uh, program as it pertains to the developer loan fund. I believe we're up, up, up to about close to eight million out the door from that program. Um, and uh, the banks that are associated with these particular uh, funds, Amalgamated Bank with $20 million to our Emerging Developer Loan Fund, which provides some gap financing for our the most expensive financing in the marketplace for our MWBE firms and small business firms. And then also um, Bank of America, um, ten million dollars, and TD Bank, ten million dollars for the contract finance loan uh, fund. Um, so how did we get the banks to move? I think uh, the mayor convened the banks, uh, I believe, back in 2016, and we, from there, had conversations over about uh, nine months or so with the banks about uh, contributing to our efforts. And uh, since then, we were able to um, speak with them, and they're their colleagues, and uh, I believe the banks that are partnering with us are very excited. And Union Bank, which was a, um, a bank that came in at a million dollars as well as one of our depository banks. And so we're very excited that we're not just use, utilizing the city resources, but we went to the private sector to find partners, and we're doing so. Um, I think that covered all of the... The, the last and, and probably most important is how do MWBs find out oh, yes. um, and actually get this money. Uh, so through our network of um, NYC Business Solution Centers, uh, we have a, f a finance access to capital product uh, that we help all small businesses find capital. Um, so this is now one of the tools that if MWB is looking um, to actually, and in, in the MWB has to be bidding, that's the best time for them to actually come to us. So if they're in the process of bidding, uh, we will help them as we help others, similar to how we help other small businesses uh, to apply for the, um, for the loan. Um, and um, ideally, uh, when they win the contract, then they can draw down on, on, on this uh, fund. Um, it has been, um, it, it's actually been a great tool um, and we want to make sure that other MWVs know that this is available. Um, and I'd be remiss to not say that with the extra uh, tools that we got from the state yesterday, uh, we expect to see an uptick on the bond side because one of the challenges, we we run the bond readiness program, uh, but a lot of firms would not actually go to the process of actually getting a bond without a guarantee work. Um, and now that we have this mentorship program uh, and the ability to sort of create um, opportunities for guaranteed work, I suspect we will see uh, um, uh, more uh, utilization on our bond uh, collateral fund as well. And, and so just to be clear, you, in addition to being a certified MWBE, in order to qualify, you must be uh, applying for financing as a prime or subcontractor toward a city, toward a contract with the city agency or city-funded entity. Right. So the way that the program works is that um, you have to actually have a contract with a city agency. Uh, or if you are a subcontractor, that prime contractor agrees to an assignment. Um, so um, either either or, and, and we work with uh, the, the, the CDFIs, the Community Development Financial Institutions that are part of, did I say that too fast? The community? No, I just would like okay. you to tell us the names of those institutions so folks can reach out to them too. Well, they should reach out to us. Okay. Because we make the determination on which CDFI is the best CDFI uh, for uh, that particular business. Uh, again, business owners spend an enormous amount of time trying to find capital. Um, and our value add as a city through our NYC Business Solution Centers is that we will look at the business, we will look at the, where the business is at that point in time in terms of uh, their, their financial capacity, and then we will make the determination on where we, they would have the best success in actually getting the capital that they need, and we're employing that same strategy for this program. And uh, the name of that program is the Contract Financing Loan Fund. Correct. Uh, folks can visit nyc.gov slash nycbusiness. Uh, it's actually a lot easier just to find if you Google Contracting Finance Loan Fund, or it is the first link if you Google NYC MWBE Loans. 
Uh, that's my first round of questioning. I'd like to turn it over to Council Member Rose, S Baron S Rosenthal. Working. We've been joined by uh, <laughs> Council Member Yeager. Uh, we try to run hearings that are good enough that people will keep watching and then like tweet in and say, thanks, I got $500,000 because I watched this. Wow. Those uh, kind of match the procurement goals, right? I like that. Um, first, I want to congratulate you on S6418A and A8407. Um, that's huge. Uh, I'm really glad to see that. Um, parity seems to be the word for this budget um, session. Uh, City Council fought for parity for a lot of different um, groups, and uh, I'm really glad to see that we're, we're going to have parity with the state. Um, so uh, the disparity study um, ulti ultimately made three recommendations to the city, two of which are covered by my um, proposed intro 1293, um, which was to expand the minority categories to include Native American-owned firms and reestablish goals for Asian-American firms in the professional services category. And I did understand you to say that you're supporting that, this legislation, right? Okay. Um, is the administration pursuing the third disparity study recommendation to expand the $100,000 cap on goods and commodities contracts? Uh, yes, that is, I believe, in Councilmember Cornegie's bill. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's in um, 1452. Yes. And we do support But you are supporting that? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, the disparity study released in 2018 did not include the last three years of the city utilization data for MWBEs. Um, you know, could you tell us why that is? And um, do you believe that the study is an accurate reflection of the current utilization or available trends? Yeah, I would start with saying yes, we do believe that and stand by the disparity study. Um, the disparity study, uh, historically have been a capture of a, sort of a moment in time um, and which we then have to base policies on. Um, once we get the uh, disparity study consultant in to do the work uh, and then there's a report that is made and then distributed to the public, then we do have to come to the legislative process to update uh, that work and then again um, uh, start to execute on those implementation um, uh, recommendation. So uh, for us, um, yes, uh, you know, we believe that it's accurate. Um, the, the process begins again um, in earnest. Mm -hmm. uh, the state has a similar process and we have a similar process. I think how we uh, govern uh, utilization on how we go about goal setting, uh, that is a very accurate and real time assessment of what is, um, who is there and who's available, et cetera based upon uh, the firms that are on the SBS directory. And so we're very confident uh, concerning those goals and particularly because of the rigor that they went through in order to s do the statistical analysis to make sure that we are uh, constitutionally sound. But it didn't include the last three years. So do you see that there would be any disparity or any difference in, in the outcomes or the data? Well, I, I, I now let uh, Commissioner Bishop speak a little bit more on it, but we won't. I wouldn't say that we would know for sure if there would be additional uh, disparities from the examining the last three years. But what I can say is, once we complete a disparity study and it goes into implementation and the goals are set, every contract is assessed for goals based on that contract and based on the availability of the MWBEs, and so. I think there's a real-time component to this that mm -hmm. actually happens. I think the disparity study is the underpinning for the program for a constitutional basis. But when we're dealing with the availability of firms that are currently in our system, mm -hmm. how we do goal set and that's stipulated in local law one as well, that every contract must be assessed for goals based on the current availability okay. and proven that way, I think that's how we stay current out you know, in the interim as we do from go from disparity study to disparity study. So it, it will be a constantly evolving reference point rather than just a, a rubber stamp? Static, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. 
So I, I was just to, to clarify in terms of timing, um, because the very nature of a disparity study, uh, this is not something that happens in three months. Um, so um, every municipality has to do a disparity study, and the timing is about the same, which is uh, we put out this RFP in 2015. Um, so the vendor was selected in uh, 2015, and the data collection happened in 2016, which is why you're seeing that this that that sort of disconnect. Um, so you know um, the the process of actually creating disparity study, we have to make sure that there's enough time uh, for community engagement. For example, mm -hmm. uh, we have to make sure that the analysis uh, is because this is the underpinning, the legal underpinning of a program. Uh, so disparity studies typically take about a year, a year and a half. So that's why you'll always see that lag with the, the, the data that's cited in the study yeah. because it's based on when the actual data collection happened. Uh, but as Janelle said, as agencies are, are, um, are actually uh, making uh, and putting the goals on, they are looking at, at uh, current information. Um, many of the, um, the MWBEs provided recommendations that they believed would improve the interaction in the city's procurement process. Um, were any of these recommendations um, implemented um, and considered? Uh, yeah, we, you know, we, um, we meet with our, ag our, our agencies on a regular basis to communicate to them some of the recommendations. Um, we do have um, policies within uh, sort of uh, compliance world, monitoring. Um, outreach is one that many of our MWBEs um, have concern about uh, are we reaching out to firms how do they get connections with the actual buyers at the agency so uh, what we've done uh, together with SBS and uh, our office and um, our city agencies we started and I know the commissioner would talk a lot about this as well our borough forums so we mm -hmm. we come to your borough wherever you are this is we're going into the third iteration of that and we have um, MWBE uh, fairs in every borough. We used to just have one big fair, and now we have fairs in every borough. So the, the MWBs in that particular borough can actually have interaction with the senior agency folks at those particular forums. And also, we encourage agencies themselves, not only the, on a citywide basis, but agencies also host um, several uh fairs and uh, to speak to their specific procurement process. And so those are recommendations that we, we heard from a lot of our MWBEs, but also some of the things that we've advocated for, such as raising the discretionary threshold, parity with the state, having pre-qualified list, the best value provision, all these things we've heard from them and we've implemented through state law, which as you know, um, is a feat within itself to get that done. And we got it done last time to 150, now 500,000, all of the other components. And, and that's how we sort of turned that feedback into action at the, st at the city. Um, one of the, the issues um, MWBs have is that um, they're not notified when they're awarded a contract um, or they receive little feedback about their contracts. Is there a process to communicate how a business might improve um, their bid or the reasons why they didn't win um, or get some mm -hmm. constructive feedback? Yeah, so I'll start and, and uh, Commissioner Bishop will talk specifically about a lot of work that his agency does. But so we encourage every agency uh, to uh, have debriefs. So if you apply or you submit a bid or you an RFP and you did not win, uh, you can request a debrief with that agency and say, I would like to know why I did not win. And sometimes it's just sharpening your pencils, as we say, that you need to do, you know, tweaking here and there. Maybe some of the estimating is off. Maybe something is awry over here um, that will help an, a an MWBE get a contract. Uh, we've started that process, and I think, you know, we want to say, you know, starting off at 8% and after three quarters, um, you know, in 15 and after three quarters this year we're at 24 percent a lot of that is really a white glove service that we're providing to our firms uh, to understand the city's processes and to learn about them and SBS of course um, I always like to say this and so he doesn't say it I say it all the time uh, really about two-thirds of the the agent the uh, firms that win uh, contracts with the city have utilized one of the services the, the services that SBS has and so 
we're very excited about that, that what we're, we're giving our firms is actually working and helping them to win and succeed. Commissioner. So um, this gives me a perfect opportunity to talk about our technical assistance um, because I think a lot of MWBs should be aware. And, of course, this is um, due to in part of, of the investment that the mayor has done in the, in the MW program that we are now able to provide um, that white glove treatment for uh, if any business is looking to get help with responding to a bid or RFP, uh, we have uh, um, a staff that will uh, sit down with them and review their RFP or, or their bid uh, for their technicalities um, because we want to make sure that their bid is not tossed out because it's unresponsive. Uh, that service is free. Um, and as Janelle said, uh, we do, and it's, a, it's part of our, our, our agency training, we do remind agencies that if MWBs are unsuccessful, and request a, a debrief uh, that they should provide that. Um, if MWBs are having issues um, with getting that, we, through our vendor services team, uh, will work closely uh, with the MWB and with the agencies to facilitate that meeting uh, because it's helpful to understand you know, who and, and uh, who, was, who, who actually won and what were some of the, the reasons why they won so then the next time the MW, MWB bids, uh, they could take into account um, you know, those factors as well. Once this proposal, um, this intro passes, um, and I'm sure it's going to pass, um, how will you notify, um, just, just how will you get the word out that the, um, that the term, the definition of minority group has been amended? So there's, there's a couple of ways we can do that. Uh, we have a robust um, network of community partners um, that helps us, um, and actually through funding from city council, uh, that helps us with providing one-on-one -on -one assistance with certification. Uh, we have our NYC Business Solution Centers um, that works with individuals who also uh, need help with packaging of applications. Um, and through uh, generous um, uh, support uh, from uh, the mayor's office at, uh, office at MWBE, um, we also have uh, been able to uh, aggressively market the program. Uh, so uh, between, uh, and of course, you, our, our council partners. Um, so literally between the four um, areas, uh, we will uh, work to make sure that if there is someone who is now of Native American origin, uh, they will be able to, to um, learn about that. We've also, um, in the past, uh, we've worked closely with the state. Uh, so we do have a data exchange um, uh, relationship with the state. So we know where some of uh, the state certified firms are uh, who are Native Americans. Uh, uh, so we will be able to contact them uh, to let them know that, hey, now that you're, since you're certified with the state, you can now fast track into with the city. Uh, so there's a number of ways we can do it. And happy if there's anything else that I, I left out, happy to take suggestions uh, from you and, and from advocates out there. And businesses that have previously tried to be a part of the process, but were not able to. Correct. And I don't think we have a large number, uh, but we will look at our database for anyone that was uh, rejected because they were not eligible uh, and uh, reconnect with them as well. Okay. Um, and um, I, I can't wait till we extend the, the cap. That's, um, that's going to happen as soon as we pass this, right, Chair Kayla? <laughs> Um, you, was there any um, when you when you considered expanding the cap? Um, what were the metrics you looked at? What what determined? What was the determination? And this is uh, the, the hundred thousand. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so so the disparity study, uh, very, very complex methodology and, mm -hmm. and, and data that they looked at. We looked at the available market look at the available firms in that market, what we buy and say that are, do we have enough firms to actually supply and is there a disparity with the utilization? And so just as the other components of the, the disparity study, uh, that was also looked at. Was, is there a market for goods uh, above that cap? And we found, uh, the disparity study found that there was. And so, um, yeah, with the bill uh, being passed, um, I think we can uh, put that into application as soon as Rules allow us to because I know I there's several it's rules that we have days. to go through and uh, right. <laughs> etc. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you to the chair. Thank you to the panel for coming. 
How long does it take a business to get certified from the time that they apply to the time that so this, this uh, I want to be clear, uh, because there's always confusion between the state and the city. Uh, for the city of New York, we are six to eight weeks. Uh, you may have heard uh, some businesses complaining about a year or two. Uh, that is not the city of New York. Um, I feel for my counterpart at the state, um, but we have the resources, uh, thanks to the mayor, uh, where we are doing it, um, in, and in some cases, uh, even faster, if they are certified with other entities. And how many, uh, the certifications that, that you've issued, do you keep them categorized by race and by gender? Yes, we do. Um, so in, in terms of um, the numbers that we gave you was for the end of fiscal year eight, uh, FY18. Um, um, but we do keep it categorized by race and, and gender. And is that information indicated in the uh, vendor directory? Yes. So, for example, if you are on um, the online directory and you're, you want to find out how many uh, women-owned firms are certified, you can just check the box for all WBEs, and the directory will spit out every single uh, WBE. If you are looking for how many minority women, uh, you could just check both boxes. It allows you to uh, check multiple boxes um, uh, for you to, to figure out um, how many firms are certified. Okay, so uh, according to the briefing material that I looked at, of the, I think it's 835 million that was awarded in prime contracts for FY18, uh, the total dollar value of these prime awards is indicative of 74, no, 47% going to Asian male-owned businesses, 23% going to businesses owned by white women, 10% going to businesses owned by black males, and 2% going to women, uh, Hispanic women-owned businesses. And I'm missing black women. I don't have that number here. Uh, do, you have, do you have that number? You're asking me if we've Yes. Do you have the number for black women um, of the $835 million that went to prime contracts? I'm looking at um, – hold on one second. I just want to make sure are – we, are, we, are you talking about FY18? FY18, okay. yes. Okay. I just want to make sure we're all in the same – uh, so okay. for, for black women, it's about 3%. About 3%. Okay. For prime and contracts. of the $258 million in subcontracts, 43% went to white women-owned businesses, 21% to Hispanic male-owned businesses, 16% to Asian male, 13% to black male-owned businesses, 5% to Hispanic women-owned businesses, 1% to Asian, and less than 1% to black women-owned businesses. That's for the subcontracts. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So is that indicative of the percentages of businesses that have been certified by the city? Is that comparable to what we see in the number of businesses that have been certified? You said you keep data as to how many are certified by race and by gender. Is that indicative yeah, or so are the factors, so perhaps mm -hmm. the contracts themselves, does that match? How can we? How can we make some kind of comparison here that would give us an explanation why black women are at the bottom? Right, and, and that is one of the things that we have um, uh, talked about in the past. Uh, so when we did our analysis, um, we, we look at the types of companies that are certified, and that has actually influenced uh, our, in this fiscal year, how we target our certification. Uh, black women-owned firms, are in areas um, uh, that we do not see either large amounts of contract values or contracting. Um, the, our black firms that are currently certified uh, are very small. They're about three or less employees. Uh, so those firms may not have the capacity. Uh, so we have uh, specifically uh, created a strategy in terms of how we can get more uh, black women-owned firms 
uh, certified. There are f- there are black women on engineering firms uh, that are out there. There are bla- uh, that have the capacity to work. Um, some of them have decided not to certify in the city of New York. Uh, some of them are did not know about the program. Uh, we've worked, for example, with our, our black uh, sororities uh, to uh, get the word out and, and to actually uh, talk about how certification has its benefits. Uh, so we are very uh, concerned, as similar as you are, uh, with uh, the numbers. W- and uh, the deputy mayor, and, and Janelle could talk a little bit more about this, but the deputy mayor has talked and he's been very uh, f- uh, upfront about the disparity within the disparity. Um, and we want to make sure that we focus in, and we have, as an agency, uh, targeted a lot of our resources on our, our black and Hispanic firms uh, to make sure that we give them as much support as possible in order to be uh, competitive uh, and in order to build their back office um, uh, to make sure that they are uh, participating in the marketplace. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, so, I mean, we this is a, this is a, a big concern for us. Um, I think part of why we need more tools is that we, wherever there is discretion, uh, we see that we have higher utilization. Um, we can target more appropriately. I also want to say that you know, doing business with the city, um, you know, uh, it's not. Uh, we are trying to make it as easy and and and, and um, transparent as possible. But certainly, businesses have to deal with the marketplace, as mentioned by our chair earlier. Uh, business play, businesses have to deal with the marketplace, and the marketplace itself is discriminatory against uh, black women firms in particular, even when it comes to venture capitals. We heard this and saw the studies from last year. Um, less than 2% of dollars of venture capital go to black women, and uh, that is at black women-owned businesses when they're added 350,000 jobs to the economy. The only group that's doing that effectively over the last decade. And so uh, we have a challenge because, you know, the, these firms are in the marketplace. They have to go get loans. They have to go get insurance. And they're being uh, discriminated um, in the marketplace as stipulated by all types of different studies that we've reviewed. But also when they come to the city, are they ready yet and, and able to participate in our program? And so two things. One, as the commissioner said, we see this as an issue. This is a concern, and that's why we're able to speak about some of the things he's doing to and his agency is doing to target it. But really, uh, for us, it's getting more tools where we have discretion. A- and I think at that point, uh, going to the state and getting the state to give us additional dollars uh, uh, for our discretionary threshold, which we've done twice now and been successful, really amazing results. Uh, we can use that to really go into where the disparity study shows there is discrepancies within the utilization versus availability and address those very uh, strategically. And so those are the tools we have, and we intend to execute and use those tools more effectively. Thank you. Uh, in, in the Also in the uh, briefing paper, it said that there are 35 agencies that is subject to the MWBE participation goals. But mainly three agencies were the ones that awarded contracts. And those three agencies were DDC, DPR, and DEP. And the total amount, uh, I think was 467.6 million that those agencies were were recipients of. No, that was just for, I think, DDC. Then my question becomes, that sounds great, but what percentage of their budget is that? It sounds like a great number, but when you look at the totality of what their budgets are, are there other agencies that are doing better in terms of the percentage of awards that are given, even though they have a smaller budget? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. So uh, th- thank you, Council Member, for that question. I think it um, goes to the heart of the procurement process and what we sell and how much of it we sell of it. You know, so when we're talking about DDC, DEP, DOT, you talk, you know, those are significant numbers of uh, for capital, and so a lot of our capital agencies are. Um, really have large budgets when it comes to procurement because these things cost cost quite a bit. And certainly, you'll, so you'll see higher utilization in those agencies. Uh, for the agencies that are non-capital agencies, uh, they actually have 
uh, very high utilization because you know they're they're not engaged in, in the heavy construction, civil construction, etc. That where sometimes there's a challenge uh, for some of our firms to come in as primes, but they come in as subcontractors. Uh, so I think um, you know it depends on the agency and what what they actually procure. Uh, that's how we're able to determine uh, that level, and then of course their budgets because again the capital is is a lot more than their expense. Uh, uh, but this is why we're excited about, again, I keep coming back to, to Albany because I'm so excited about it. Uh, for the first time in our city's history, uh, we went from 20,000 discretionary to 150,000, but it did not include construction. Uh, this time we went from 150,000 uh, 150, to 500, but it also includes construction, which is now 35,000. Can you think, believe, think of that for a moment? 35,000 discretionary we currently have for construction. But now, with this bill that was just passed, it's at 500,000. That's one thing. And then, so that's huge for us to help build up our firms in that particular uh, industry. And secondly, uh, now we have authorization to do a mentorship program at DDC, uh, where we know there's a lot of opportunity that is consistent. And DDC does work also for other agencies around the city, not mm -hmm. just DDC work, but other uh, capital agencies. And so, Again, we are strategically looking at where the gaps are and the disparity study allowed us to see that, but also some of the work we've been doing uh, over the last two years and so some of those uh, tactics we are imply, um, impl employing now in order to uh, better utilization in, with those agencies. Uh, I thank you and I look forward to hearing about the success of your initiatives to, do, uh, to increase the number of black women-owned women. businesses so that they can have some support as they overcome the historic, historic. racist uh, obstacles that they have found, that they have had, had to overcome over the past. I look forward to hearing about your great success at the next hearing that you come to. Thank you. Thank you I'll give you a year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, turning it over to Council Member Rosenthal. Um, thank you so much. I wanna pick up on the questions that Council Member Barron was just asking. Um, in looking through what the current, uh, in, in Councilmember Rose's bill, what the con current uh, disparity numbers are, um, does, I noticed that um, for women, for the, there's a category called women, is that really just Caucasian women? Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. And are there goals in the disparity study for black women and Hispanic women? Because I know you track that in utilization. Yes, uh, there is goals for black women and this, so there's disaggregated goals throughout uh, the disparity study. So mm -hmm. every category, um, if you're a minority and um, the group that mm -hmm. you are a part of, yep. and also um, for women as well. So is this bill a uh, bird's eye view and the details are in the disparity study and the details are also encompassed in this bill? Uh, this bill highlights the disparity that was found and, right. and, and sort of um, indicates the change. So I would say yes, it, it has all of the, the detail as to why it's what it is. No, no, that's no, in the I'm just study. getting at, if you read the bill, mm -hmm. it does not have the category black women, right? Oh, no, it, it has a category that says black Americans that I think includes both women oh. and men. And oh, then I there's a category oh, called women that mm. we've established are Caucasian women. And I'm just oh. wondering where I can find oh. what the disparity number is for black women in each of the categories. And I think the answer is it's in the It's thick. encompassed in uh, the minority category. Can, can I? Just right. ask for a point of clarification. In the disparity study, there's multiple notes, and including in this document and other documents, that um, the women's category, I believe, should be encompassing women regardless of 
race. No. Um, well, I just want to <laughs> clarify this. <laughs> That's what they, they just said. No, no, I know. But if they did, it would be contradicting the disparity study. So I just want to, because in the disparity study, it says it, there's a there's several asterisks, and it says uh, that uh, these when you add up the women and the different. Uh, uh, minority groups that it doesn't come to 70% as the number should if it only included Caucasian women and it didn't have the overlap. So I guess the thing is, so so ju you you already gave a straight answer to Councilmember Rosenthal and and if she uh, if you are correct and her hunch is correct then what have you. But I based on the disparities executive summary which I can give you a copy of, the definition of women includes. All women, regardless of race, yes. not just Caucasian women. So I think the uh, classification category here is specified as Caucasian women in the citywide um, in the citywide uh, reporting categories. It's established as the Caucasian women, right? And so in each of the uh, ethnic categories, I believe that classification is inclusive of both men and uh, male and female owned ethnic uh, owned businesses. But if you're both minority and women owned for the reporting purposes for the citywide goals that are established, it's set at the minority group. Thank you. Um, and then one thing I noticed is that, and on that I will say that I was just looking at the most recent utilization numbers, and I noticed that for, I, I was just looking very quickly, but for the construction contracts, which is the first category, and Councilmember Rose's bill, for black Americans, the disparity goal is 12% uh, now, and utilization is, in fact, at 12%. So it, it, you seem to be meeting the goal just for that one little micro category, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then the other thing I noticed that I just want some clarification on is that emerging businesses always seem to be at 6%, but in every category, and it doesn't seem to change over time. Um, I was wondering, and then I was looking at the utilization numbers, and didn't the utilization, at least in construction, that was the first chart appendix that I pulled up, it was at zero. And I'm just wondering, one, did I read it too fast? <laughs> Which is, would probably be the case. Or um, are there very few emerging construction companies? So, um, so the emerging is the Emerging Business Enterprise Program, uh, which okay. is separate from the MWB program. Okay. Uh, that program was created uh, with the realization that there may be other disadvantaged groups that may not be eligible for the MWB program. For example, LGBTQ, uh, really white LGBT, LGBTQ uh, individuals or white, uh, for example, uh, Hasidic Jewish individuals. People or with disabilities. Or people with disabilities yeah. or white oh, male I veterans. Uh, white male veterans. Uh, okay. So the EBE program was created uh, many years ago to capture those disadvantaged groups. Um, the program uh, is still certifying, uh, but we do not have a lot of companies that are certified. We are looking to uh, build, uh, similar to how we did the MWB program in terms of building uh, the number of companies certified. Uh, so as a result, uh, agencies, as because we are here, agencies have focused a lot of their efforts uh, to actually address the disparity for minority uh, you know, men and women as we continue building the certification pool for EBE. And so I looked very quickly at construction. Was I accurate that the number, it, the utilization number is zero? Uh, it is probably, uh, I, I, I do not have it in front of me, yeah. but knowing how the goals that we place on, on contracts, it is probably accurate that EBE utilization is zero. Uh, and a part of that, a big part of that is our certified pool. Uh, because and so it, there are very few LGBTQ companies in your certified pool. As of right now, uh, we are work correct. As of as of today, okay. uh, we are working closely with uh, with the different stakeholders in those communities and also in our veteran community uh, to continue monitoring um, and, and figure out how we can get more companies uh, certified. But again, I want to remind everyone 
that if you are a veteran and you're a black or Asian or a woman, you can certify in the MW program. Uh, if you're a white male veteran, then you will have to certify in the EB program. Uh, and the same thing if you are in the LGBTQI uh, community and you're black, you're, uh, you identify yourself as a woman uh, or you're Asian or Hispanic, uh, you can certify in the MW program. And for most of the categories, the MW category is higher Correct. Then the MW the MW program uh, um, can capture most of uh, individuals who are who could also certify as EBE, um, with the exception, um, as I said, of white men. Well, and it looks like Native Americans would be better off trying to certify as emerging businesses because it, their disparity numbers are so small. Um, the number of firms that are out there. Are so far, are so tiny. Well, so in this disparity, we were able to actually get a statistical uh, uh, sample, yep. which is why we have this bill now because we have sh uh, shown that there is a large, there is a large enough number of M of Native American firms that could actually certify into the MWB program. Uh, but the they reason would be why better served going in. I mean, unless I'm misunderstanding. You the so you're not misunderstanding the the the. the the challenge, though, is that agen agencies have to decide on what sort of what goals to put on contracts. So the EB program, uh, it's it's not race or gender based. It's based on a disadvantage and a business size, which is why it's a flat six percent. Mm -hmm. I I could get into I I would have to. No, get I back mean to you it's fine, and we of, could right. talk about why it's six percent. Right. I think we would have to talk about because remember. Uh, for an agency, the agency only has one contract. So the question then becomes, in that one contract, of which course. goals do we put? Um, and we as administration have put our focus um, on the MW program because we have a, a, a large enough uh, number of certified firms in the MW program. Uh, so that way we don't see agencies uh, requesting um, you know, exemptions or prime contractors re requesting exemptions. Uh, based on the fact there's no availability. Right. Uh, however, we are working and we continue to work on building the pool of EBE um, uh, uh, companies. Uh, so um, at some point in time in the future, when we get parity between both the MW program and EB program in terms of number of certified firms, yes, it, for Native Americans, it could actually be beneficial uh, to actually certify in both areas, yep. actually. Yeah, so. makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you very much. This is all impressive. I mean, my biggest takeaway looking at Councilmember Rose's bill is that you are up in every single category. I mean, that if you look by groupings uh, for each of the contract areas and you look from 2009 to 2013 to 2019, the only direction is up. The only direction is up. The one exception is in the construction uh, contracts. Um, previously, in 2009, the goal was 13, the disparity number was 13%. In 2013, it went down to 8%, likely due to the recession. And then it came back up, and now it's at 12%. And in fact, you're meeting that 12% number. That's incredibly impressive. Um, the other one that went down but then came up is the Hispanic uh, contract, uh, construction contract category. But, I mean, this is incredibly impressive if you just look at the larger categories that you're up in every single one. And my guess is your utilization is similar. I mean, it'll be interesting to go through each category then if that is the case, I would agree with Council Member Barron, the next step is to drill down into yeah. um, each of the minority ca categories and call out the women. Um, see where your utilization is, where the goal is, and, and focus at SBS on how to get those numbers up. Mm -hmm. I, I thank you for your time and your response. 
when I was uh, referring to the WBE, you asked about the disparity study um, and the table that was in the key findings. And I see where you're talking about that they had an asterisk there that says that WBE category here is inclusive of all the different minority groups. Um, I think I conflated that with how we report our uh, um, numbers in our local law one uh, quarterly compliance report. In there, we do uh, disaggregate the minority groups, but the WBE category in our compliance reports are just for the Caucasian women yeah. category. Right. And, and just wanted to clarify and that. And so for intro 1293 purposes and legislative intent, when you say uh, women should go from 18% to 253 Six six. Um, that is inclusive of women in minority groups or not. And the reason I'm curious now about your response is because in the 2013 bill, it specifies that it's Caucasian women. So if now you're including all minorities in the women category, that's just uh, you no longer can compare the numbers because what the grouping has changed. So has the grouping changed? And, and I'll just explain yeah. why we're and and so then I'm, I don't really need to know, but we, well, we, we do, should know that we we do need to know, know because we received testimony for the record. They're not going to be testifying today, but the General Contractors Association testified, uh, quote, without any analytical basis, intro 1293 would increase the citywide MWB goals for construction to 73.27%, which includes 6% for emergency business enterprises, um, and that that would be outside the disparities report, which got to 53%, so it would take you 20% mm -hmm. uh, over, and, and I'm encouraging you to go to 50%, um, but I guess, well, we want to keep it constitutional. I want to make sure that we address uh, GCA's concerns. And GCA may, if GCA and, and Councilmember Rosenthal are correct, I just want to make sure we're, yeah. Unfortunately, I have to step out uh, for another meeting, but I'm sure you'll get back to okay, us with the accurate well, understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have anything on the spot or? I think we can follow up with you. I think it's coming to our, our attention. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I want to thank GCA for submitting the testimony so that we, we had it on hand. Uh, do we have any additional questions? Uh, just for the panel, we have additional questions we may submit to you in writing. It is, uh, it is 3 o'clock, so, um, and we have a handful of panels. Uh, I, I just want to, if my staff can take a quick photo, and if anyone wants to be in the photo, if you want to smile, like this is a pretty packed room, even if we don't have that many folks testifying. So uh, I want to thank this panel for all the great work, your success in Albany. Look forward to working with you, possibly code pairing with you, and uh, just trying to make it even better. So uh, thank you. The next panel we'll be uh, bringing up uh, is Jacqueline Tacarante. Uh, so uh, we want to thank Jacqueline for coming and uh, Councilmember Rose for inviting her. Uh, I'd also like to invite uh, Harshad L, uh, as well as uh, Ravi S. Uh, both of them are from the Alliance of New York Asian Architects and Engineers. And the final panel after this panel will be Ken Fisher from ACEC of New York. Uh, Vicky Arbitrio on behalf of ACEC of New York, uh, Ram T from ANAYE, and uh, Brian Cunningham from BC Building Contractors Association. So that will be our second panel. And uh, we we will uh, we will start with uh, Councilmember Rose's guest. Jacqueline, uh, identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, uh, speaking to the microphone. And if if you brought guests with you, if they want, if you want them to sit behind you, they'll be on camera and on TV. If you want. I would love the red phone to be right next to me. Uh, 
Uh, there should be a yeah, red indicator. Okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Callis of the Committee of Contracts and the entire committee for the floor, including City Council Member Debbie Rose. My name is Jacqueline Tacarante, and I'm a small business owner living in the greenest borough, Staten Island. In 2017, my marketing and public relations agency, JMT Media, applied for the coveted Minority Women Business Enterprise Certificate with the encouragement of Staten Island Borough Hall, Staten Island Economic Development Corporation, the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce, and the Small Business Development Center. I'm a proud Native American. After nine months of an intense and vetted application process, it was truly a shock to find out that my application was denied. Not because I didn't have solid financial statements and not because of a lack of business acumen. I was denied simply because of my minority status. Currently in New York City legislation, the minority group term means black Americans, Asian Americans, and Hispanic Americans. But what is a minority if it is not the indigenous Native Americans? The current poverty level for Native Americans is at 26%, while for the nation, the poverty rate is at 14%. With Native Americans having the lowest employment rate of any racial or ethnic group in the United States, economic development and the inclusion to bid and apply for city contracts is essential in creating economic growth for my borough and for my city. In the 2018 Making the Grade report that we referred to, the city spent more than $1.5 billion through contracts in 2018. MWBEs received only $102.5 million. That is less than 7%. Of this spending, Hispanic American owned businesses and African Americans received less than 1% combined. Native Americans, zero. What's happening on paper is not happening in real life. We need to change the paper. This administration has done tireless work to diversify all facets of our great city. But diversity extends beyond three ethnic groups. There are others that also need to be recognized. And without Native Americans, the MWBE standard is incomplete for New York City. Native Americans share a painful history. While we can't rewrite the history, today you can change the history by changing the law to include this group who have been marginalized and impoverished. New York City is the strongest, most resilient city in the United States, and the inclusion of every race should never be omitted again. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you. Next. Uh, please state your name and your affiliation, and yeah. you may begin. My name is uh, Ravi Shinoy. I am the president uh, of uh, Shinoy Engineering, a minority MEP uh, business organization in the construction industry. Uh, let me Thank you uh, for the committee for uh, inviting uh, for holding this important uh, hearing to review and hear testimony on two pieces of uh, crucial legislation which will greatly improve, which greatly improve, expand the New York City MWB program. Like I said, my name is Ravi Shanoi and I own Shanoi Engineering PC MEP design firm in the construction industry. It is my honor to testify in the presence of this esteemed committee. I was a partner of a MBA firm in New York City for 24 years, where I actively provided MEP design services to various city agencies, such as DDC, DCAS, DEP, DOS, DHS, DOC, DPR, and Health and Hospital Corporation as a subconsultant MBE firm. I designed numerous complex and challenging projects, including sanitation garages, parks, museums, libraries, courts, hospitals, several 
new jails on Rikers Island during the 1980s and the 1990s, and the various community centers. When I founded my own certified MBE firm in 2003, I hope to use the knowledge and experience I gained over the 24 years. But right after starting my firm, I was dealt with a devastating blow of the enactment of local law 129 in 2005, then later amended as local law one in 2013. When I approach the clients with whom I had worked and developed a reputation and experience for all those years, they said they were forced to look into different avenues to fulfill MWV participation goals. Uh, just to let you know, between the years 2007 and 2016, for 10 years, various city agencies awarded contracts with a gross fee of close to a billion dollars with a corresponding MEP fee could be around $300 million, where firms like mine and owned by the Asian uh, Americans would have great opportunity to participate. That is something, the great opportunity we missed. Due to the enactment of this law, Asian businesses in New York lost business, business opportunities and the inability to grow our business and staff. Since we believe hiring a diverse workforce, this has negatively impacted the broader community at large. Not being able to participate in the MWB program that resulted in the loss of revenue for us, loss of specialized knowledge due to loss of work, loss of business, and, and the downsizing. We greatly appreciate your leadership as advocates of the MWB community and your efforts to increase the opportunity to MWB businesses in New York City. We anticipate great things coming from our re-inclusion in the MWB program and look forward to working with the city, its agencies, and the citizens. Thank you for this opportunity to share my testimony, my experience with you, and for your continued commitment to New York's M MWB community. Thank you very much. Hi, <coughs> excuse me. Hi, I'm Harshad Lakhani, uh, president of Lakhani and Jordan Engineers. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Chair, and, uh, and all, all of you in the committee uh, for allowing me to testify uh, for the inclusion of Asian Indians uh, into the MBE program. I have already submitted my testimony, but so what I want to do here is to give you a little bit more of my personal uh, experience. Uh, I personally uh, started my own firm in 1992, and within five years, it's okay. Oh, oh, okay. <clears throat> so I, I started my firm in 1992 with two employees, and within five years, I had grown from two to 40 employees, and mainly, mainly uh, due to the uh, Asians being included in the goals for MBE program. We, my business uh, mix was about 30, 33%, one third, two third, one third private, two third, uh, working with the agencies like the, 
uh, like Department of uh, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Correction, City University of New York, Department uh, a Agency for Children's and Department of Health. Uh, we provided engineering services uh, on projects like uh, large water treatment, uh, one billion dollar water treatment. We are proud to be part of that that kind of a project. Uh, we worked at the, just like Ravi said, we were part of the Rikers Island program, uh, libraries, hospitals, and so forth. These kind of project gave us an opportunity to work with prestigious design architect. Again, the MBE was the platform for us to work with the prestigious, uh, prestigious architect and gain their attention. Uh, we, I'll give you one uh, example. For example, City Hall. Uh, Lakani Jordan has been an engineer for over 12 years. We have worked with various architects for providing engineering services there. Uh, within, uh, with three uh, mayor, mayors actually, uh, while operating it. And it's a landmark project. Not only I am proud of being an engineer for, a, for a, such a prestigious building, a landmark building, and we received also a, uh, an award from uh, prestigious Lucy B. Moses uh, Preservative Award uh, for the design of the city hall. This also gave us, our employee, a great training to work on a large project, which is about 150 million plus. Uh, since introduction of Local Law 129 and Local Law 1, uh, our clients had to look for another avenue, for other, other engineers, other MBE, and they pretty much dropped us. So we, it was a double blow. Not only we could not work with those clients on a, on a city project, but because they were introduced to the other engineers, we lost them on a private, private side of the business also. And to tell you very frankly, due to loss of that opportunity, we had to reduce our staff significantly. Even as of today, uh, my office, which is right across the Grand Central, uh, I have 16, op 16 positions open, 16 booths open, uh, so which I can add employees. With this new bill, with this amendment to the existing bill, I am sure that I'll be able to gain more employees, I'll be able to train more employees, and will be able to fulfill mayor's 30% quota for, for the MBE. Thank you. So something that's uh, interesting to me, I just want to make this observation. The purpose of MWB protections is to protect against existing discrimination that exists in the private marketplace and uh, where government has an opportunity to protect it. And so what is interesting to me is the Asian American community had done successfully enough to no longer have a disparity and then as soon as – and based on that assumption, the idea is that the market had corrected and that there wouldn't be disparities if you were no longer given uh, the MWB status. Uh, so I guess the question I just had to ask is, um, do, you, do you see, do you feel um, – a, do you feel a discriminatory impact in, in this modern day in the uh, private marketplace and uh, with government contracts? Either of you can answer. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No. Turn your mic on. Mine is on. Uh, no, I have, I personally have never been treated secondhand citizen in this country or in this city. Amazing. I mean, uh, I can tell you very truly, I've been blessed with that. I'm a city boy. I was born and brought up in Mumbai, and I'm here in New York. I know nothing better than that, so I've been blessed. No, I, I, I feel the same way, you know. Um, I've been um, uh, treated well, and, uh, you know, we have uh, done a lot of uh, work uh, with, you know, uh, various uh, um, firms, but um, uh, 
when you know, um, issues were uh, taken off of the um, uh, eligibility for the MW program, uh, our uh, uh, share of the businesses and um, the size of the firm was uh, greatly affected. You know. um, that, that to me says discriminatory impact. Because the, the argument is that as soon as you're not regulated and you're not at this uh, goal, you should continue because the company should have a relationship with you and they should continue to want to work with you because so very little of the money is MWV money. Actually, two-thirds of it is not. So uh, the, the idea would have been that the, the full $15 billion, y y you would have been graduating to having access to all of the money, not just the small piece of the piece of the piece. No, I, I, I agree with you, but uh, also what, like uh, uh, Ashad has indicated that uh, when we were working with uh, some of these uh, uh, architects, or you know, we basically worked with, uh, for the architects as their sub-consultants, and uh, the MW program gave us an opportunity to create that relationship with them, okay, when they uh, when we were no longer were part of the MW, that relationship, you know, disappeared, and uh, they wanted to uh, hire someone who they can, uh, you know, uh, legally require to have to meet that quota of uh, thirty percent or twenty percent or whatever it is, and since we were no longer can help them in that area. You know, they will not hire us. Not only that, even on private sector project, any other areas, they have created a new relationship with some other people. And uh, where, where did the other seventy percent of the money that wasn't part, it wasn't being put into the MWB go? Why so did it go to, to you? We used to work with, the work with them, even those other seventy percent of the work. Mm -hmm. Okay, what I'm saying is. Since we are no longer working, you know, we, uh, we're not helping with them 30% of the work, mm -hmm. and other, that relationship we had with them, and uh, you know, recently, you know, we had this a uh, lot of this project at um, a sanitation project, a Rikers Island project. You know, we mostly do the sewage uh, side projects. I mean, uh, uh, public sector projects. Um, we, to some extent, we do the private sector projects as well. In the private sector projects, you know, we have a tough time sometimes collecting the money. Okay, okay we do get the job, but collection is becoming a problem, you know. So on the public sector projects, you know, whenever we have that relationship which uh, uh, disappeared because of we no longer can help them bring to meet their quotas and all the things, uh, they have um, created a new relationship with those who th they can help them. Understood. Uh, and. Uh, how many members joined you today from the a Alliance of New York Asian I Architects and Engineers? I think we are over 10. Uh, a dozen. <coughs> uh, so I want to just thank all of you. Uh, you're welcome to submit your own. You're welcome to tweet. You're allowed to oh, what have you. But I want to thank uh, the 15 of you for coming out. Uh, I don't even want to know how much it would cost me by billable hours to <laughs> have all of you here. So I just want to thank you and your organization for coming out. I want to thank our uh, council member, Debbie Rose, for being a champion and carrying this legislation. Um, and then I had a quick question for Jacqueline, which is just I, I noticed that some of the, the guests that you are with are, are wearing items, uh, and I'm curious if there's any cultural significance to the items that they are wearing. Absolutely. So <laughs> you want to chat about your regalia and everything? Absolutely. Uh, can you? Oh, yes. Can you, uh, okay. Is that good? Oh. Okay, switch seats. Switch. So you can share your name for the record and please, learn sure. interested in learning more. Jerry Greyhawk. Uh, I am of White Mountain and Chiricahua, Apache, Southern Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Arawak ancestry. Proud Native American, proud New Yorker. And I am a co founder and uh, head singer of Red Storm Drum and Dance Troupe, Incorporated. <laughs> 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 yes, had to put that in there. And of course, our, our standing with the, uh, of course, with the public and private sector is kind of blended. So there's no one more important to the other to us as well. 
and the cultural significance of what uh, we have on now, uh, my medicine bag, which carries uh, significant items to me personally, uh, the Jocla necklace, which is a part of my heritage as well, made out of turquoise, which is a sacred stone to my people, and uh, the ribbon shirt that I wear is basically a blend of the old and new. See, uh, if anyone's ever heard about the boarding school system, when uh, many of our youth were taken from the tribes and taken and put into boarding schools, and a lot of our heritage and culture was kind of washed away, beaten away from us. And one of the things that they forbade us to do was to wear any kind of fringe on our outfits because it represented our freedom. So what the children did was they would save ribbons from presents that they would receive and strings from, from gift boxes and packages, and they would pin them onto their shirts as a kind of rebellious protest and to, sh to, to show that they are proud Native Americans. And that tradition carried on into the, the mainstream Native society where when we wear our ribbon shirts, it shows that we are proud Native Americans, and it shows that uh, through everything, through the past and uh, the painful history that we have, this is a reminder to stand strong and to show the people that we are still here. Uh, New York City, a very diverse, culturally uh, huge city, but the indigenous culture is still overlooked. And we have to raise that awareness, not only through, of course, our teachings that we do as Red Storm, but also through allowing businesses that are Native American owned to, to prosper in this beautiful city, which we love so much. Because back home where we are, we're discriminated against because people have had their personal experiences with Native Americans and it kind of made them discriminating, almost uh, racist to that point. Whereas in New York, we, we can be just like everybody else. Yeah, and we can be whatever we want because the city allows us to be whatever we want and be proud of who we are, not just try to hide and be ashamed. This is why we came today and represented as well as we could. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to the sponsor of this legislation, Councilmember Debbie Rose. Um, I just have a, a, a brief question for um, for Ms. Tacaronte. Could you just tell us briefly how um, the impact of not being included as a, a minority <coughs> in MWBE, um, how it impacted your business? Thank you, uh, City Council Member Debbie Rose. Um, so it's, it's interesting, you know, the process for a city MWBE took us close to nine months, um, whereas on a state level for an MWBE application to get vetted and approved took less than three months. And so on a city level, we've, we haven't been able to apply under the auspice of MWBE because we don't qualify. Um, we do qualify, however, for the WBE process. And um, we've gotten very close to about three different contracts, um, but the significant <coughs> and economic impact has cost us close to a quarter of a million dollars in 2018. And so that's significant for me as a small business owner because on Staten Island, um, we try to employ Staten Island college students. We try to keep the talents on Staten Island. I can certainly hire out and outsource outside of the island, but there's so much talent on Staten Island. And so we've missed that opportunity for 2018, close to a quarter of a million. For 2019 though, um, you know, I'm a big believer. I'm always using this hashtag Farmer Jackie. I'm always planting seeds. Um, so doing a lot of partnerships with SIEDC, with Borough Hall and with City Council Member Debbie Rose's office, we've been able to secure other partnerships as not even necessarily a subcontractor of a subcontractor, um, but we've been able to secure partnerships on a larger scale. Um, so we're barely hitting June, or we're towards the end of June. So we're you know looking forward to success for this year, and I'm looking forward to seeing the next steps of Farmer Jackie. Thank you. Um, uh, one of the the, um, the arguments early on was that there were not um, s a significant number of Native American businesses. Was that not so? So back in 2017, um, w I had hosted a meeting at a fantastic, another small business owner office space, um, his uh, Kevin Lowry that owns Launchpads, and I had requested um, small business uh, SBS, uh, Debbie Rose attended. We also had my attorney, Julianne Verdi, 
Um, we also had a representative from the mayor's office, Moy Barnes, and we also had the uh, disparity report consultants number on hand because I really wanted to understand why the numbers and the data were not reflected accurately. And to my amazement, unfortunately, a lot of the information was presented and the findings were based off of Dun & Bradstreet reporting. Um, and so that's a significant piece of information because a lot of small businesses, when they first start out, they do not apply for, just to have the basic verification of Dun & Bradstreet. Um, there's a lot of hurdles your first few years of opening a small business. I'm in my fourth year. And so you learn over time that you do need to have your verification, your Dun & Bradstreet information. You need to be verified. Um, because unfortunately, if, you're, if you haven't had that verification in the past seven years, you're not going to be in the analytics that were part of the disparity report. So respectfully, the disparity report that was presented in May of 2018 that was published, unfortunately, is still inaccurate, even though it's the most recent report. And so my goal here today is that the outreach and communication efforts between the administration and city council members and all of the different agencies at hand that they're effectively targeting specific small businesses and minority ethnic groups. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I just want to say to um, your, the gentleman, um, oftentimes uh, things are done and it has unintentional in, uh, you know, outcomes. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really proud to be able to say that we're going to try to uh, correct uh, those unintentional, you know, negative impacts that you've suffered. So um, I thank you for being here and giving voice to what, what the impact was and, um, and looking forward to, you know, a better outcome. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I, I wanted I just, to. Sorry, I want to follow up on what Jacqueline was saying. So, if the city is currently, if the vendor that the city is currently using, and as we put out an RFP and may have already done so for a new vendor or the same vendor to come back, if it's not done in Bradstreet and we do want to properly capture the real number of uh, uh, Native Americans who should be reflect Native American MWBE businesses or businesses that could be MWBs, what is a better measure? You know, that's a very hard question to answer um, because unfortunately I do not work on the city administration side to understand what resources are fully available, but I do know in speaking with SBS, um, SIEDC, Chamber of Commerce, Debbie Rose's office, clearly there's analytics um, that are available and that may be something that another consultant or based on the RFP, I know that there's a chief diversity officer position that y'all, the city has been looking for to really assess and review all of the findings and application for each of the boroughs and each of the agencies. So unfortunately, um, Chairman, I wouldn't be able to answer that because I don't know where all the analytics currently are at and where the metrics begin and where they're ending. Uh, so I th I, I'm a big believer in uh, citizen, citizen dra uh, not citizen, but resident drafted legislation and crowdsourcing as, was it, as it is and believing that a lot of the knowledge is not on this side of the dais, mm -hmm. but on the other side. So I guess um, to just pull from my own experience as, as a Jewish person, uh, we, we, we do, we have a, I just Googled, there's a, there's a, the Orthodox Jewish Chamber of Commerce, I know there's an Israel Chamber of Commerce. Is there a chamber of, is there a, do the Native American communities have a chamber of commerce or are there places where if Native Americans are interested in doing business to business? And, and I think the thing is, it, I'm concerned that we as a city, if we've been relying on Dun & Bradstreet, don't even know where to look. Uh, and sadly, I don't think we have a Native American elected into government and I don't know about your representative. <laughs> uh, there will be 36 <laughs> seats mm -hmm. open in 2021, <laughs> and uh, we, we, we need to have at least 26 women on the city council. Uh, I like but that. More than 21. I like that. <laughs> with, that's the adequate representation. Women outnumber men in the city. Uh, so I guess, um, 
are there resources you might know of that we can bring to the attention of the city? Uh, and and if, there's anal if there's resources you've heard of or what have you that we can tell the city we should subscribe to with our $94 billion budget? So in the past, thank you. That's a very valid question. Um, and I'm sad to say that in the past two years and going through this entire process, there's two organizations that are focused more primarily on arts and culture programming as opposed to business advocacy and education and outreach. Um, there is the Smithsonian Affiliates, the Museum of Natural History or Native American History, um, in reaching out to them to attend today's hearing. They're excited to hear, but they only have information on archives. Um, unfortunately, my tribe is Lapan Apache, and there's only 5,000 left of us in the United States. So, Chairman, you're staring at a unicorn right now. <laughs> um, but to, to be very candid and honest, there is the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce, and each borough has their Chamber of Commerce, but there is not a dedicated New York City Native American Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I think uh, for a variety of reasons, there's lack of information, lack of resources, but on a national level, there are Native American Chamber of Commerce and organizations and associations, but they're primarily in New Mexico, Arizona, and in Ponca City, Oklahoma, where I just went to visit last year. To the extent that the Small Business Services and the Mayor's Office for MWB have a mandate to be doing outreach, uh, or uh, I know that uh, as the contracts committee would be happy to partner with you and to the extent our, our council member Debbie Rose to try to host events and to be honest I've hosted events where we have 1600 people show up more often we have 30 people and sometimes I've had five people show up but you do it you keep doing it the word eventually gets out and one day it goes from three to several hundred or thousands, so uh, if, if you can give us a date that would work for you, we'd be interested in organizing, whether you want to do it on Staten Island in the great county of Richmond or anywhere else, we will do it wherever you wish. Thank you so much, Chairman. Uh, sir, I had cut you off and you no, had I'm additional good. remarks. Uh, I'm fine, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions. Thank uh, you once again for your support. No, thank you. We will uh, uh, excuse this panel. Thank you again. And to any of the members who are here, <coughs> again, you can email contracts at Ben Kalos for 72 hours from when we close this hearing. Uh, I had already called out the names of the people on the last panel. Uh, we have a uh, former council member, uh, Ken, the, the Honorable Ken Fisher, on behalf of ACEC New York. He is also a pretty tough television uh, personality. If you have a chance to, to watch his show, I recommend it. He'll tell you when you can watch. Viggy, Viggy Arbitrio from ACEC. Uh, Ram T from ANAYE District Engineers. And uh, Brian Cunningham from Building Contractors Association. Ken, you know the drill. Come on. Let's hustle. Thank you, Chair uh, Kalos, uh, Council Members. Um, thank you for the kind words. And, and Council Member Perkins will recall that I served on this committee for pretty much all of uh, my tenure at the uh, at the council. I'm going to try so to I be as tough as you are on your show. <laughs> and when I when I uh, when is your show? Actually, actually, we went off the air. Uh, it's an interesting story. I'll tell you offline. But okay. Uh, but I now do a lot on Facebook, and if you haven't, you, you and I aren't friends on Facebook yet. We uh, we should be. Okay. I don't do Twitter because uh, your brain has to work faster than mine does to keep up with that. Um, and actually, after shortly after I left the uh, the council, I was retained by um, the American Council of Engineering Companies, and I've represented them on New York City matters uh, pretty much uh, uh, since then. So I am familiar with some of the issues that um, you all are grappling with. And I want to stay at the outset um, on behalf of ACEC. Number one, um, they strongly support the objectives of the legislation and the initiatives that SBS and the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and, and uh, have taken 
um, in support of increasing participation by um, certified uh, firms on uh, A&E architectural and engineering services. Um, and in fact, that extends specifically to uh, our colleagues in the Asian and Southeast Asian uh, community. One of the concerns we had when the disparity study came out was that it established a, a goal under the category of professional services uh, for those firms, but not specifically for A&E services. And that was a concern both based on fairness, but also on the ability of the majority firms to be able to, to meet their objectives. We were told by SBS um, at a meeting that um, notwithstanding the fact that a specific disparity wasn't identified under A&E services, that nonetheless, um, the majority firms would be able to claim them under the category of professional services. Um, we don't have that in writing, but that was a, that was a relief, I think, on, on all counts. And it leads me to what we think are some methodological flaws um, in the disparity study that unfortunately are reflected to some extent um, in the legislation. Um, you know, the, uh, Chair Kalos, you know, engineers, when they do something, they want to do it right, and they want to do it based on the most accurate information. And we think that um, it's important to understand what those flaws are. There are a variety of ways that I think that they can be addressed, um, uh, both in the legislative history and in the, in the bill itself. One of them that I just alluded to is that A&E services, while they were studied separately in the disparity report, are not broken out from professional services in the legislation itself. And in fact, if you look at the disparity report, if you take the aggregate, and I, I, I know that you know, there's overlap with, with women firms, but if you just look at the aggregate uh, percentages, um, the capacity number in the A&E section of the report was 51.84%, but the goal, the aggregate goal set under professional services is 67.52%. Um, and the reason for that is, is that there are other professional services that, that tend to skew more in terms of the uh, availability of, of capacity. And, um, and, and I believe you heard me highlight that for the administration. I certainly did. Um, um, the, the, um, there's another uh, uh, aspect of that I, that I, I think is also important, and that is, you know, I, I was struck when I looked through the committee report at the um, compliance rate, if you will, of the various city agencies and how the major capital agencies, uh, their numbers look pretty low. Um, and and I, you know, I think that any of the professional engineers that deal with the city would say that that's not for lack of trying either on their part or the agency's part. When we look at the membership of ACEC, it's a trade association. It doesn't necessarily cover everybody, but it sure is a, a pretty broad sample of the industry. About 20 to 25 percent of ACEC's members are certified uh, firms, women or, um, or, or minority. But if you look at it in terms of employment, um, because a lot of the, the majority firms are big and a lot of the certified firms are small, it works out to about 8 to 10 percent of the membership by employee of ACEC are in certified firms, which is pretty consistent with what the capital agencies are, uh, are doing. Uh, there's another uh, thing that we could ask for your help on also with the administration, which is that we've asked them on eight different occasions a very simple question, which was, did the consultant only check licensed professionals um, in determining what the universe was of, of available firms. And now you'd think that would be something you could answer it the first time we asked it, not the eighth time we asked it, but we still don't have an answer. How did they actually figure out? Because there are lots of folks that use the name engineer um, in their title, whether they're supposed to or not. Um, that doesn't mean that they're licensed professional engineers of the kind that you're concerned about. So you can be a high, a licensed I, I take high- take exception to that as a software engineer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a perfect example. In fact, I, 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 yes, that was a, that was a bit of yeah. sarcasm. No, no, but correct. you know, you can be a high pressure boiler operator engineer, but that doesn't mean that you can design the boiler. You know, it, it seems pretty obvious, and, and it also it ties into, I think, the third point, um, which is that within the profession of engineering, there are a variety of different types of engineers. A civil engineer is not the same type as a mechanical engineer. Um, and just as you wouldn't want a pediatrician to do a liver transplant, you wouldn't want an electrical engineer to design a bridge. So 
we think there needs to be some acknowledgement of that. They may all have the same license, but legally, under the state education department rules, you're not supposed to do something that you're not competent in. Now, why is that a concern? Because you would think that in the uh, RFP process, that would weed out people who aren't really qualified to do the specific kind of work that the city is trying to, uh, to, uh, to procure. Um, and there are provisions for uh, relaxing the goals under those circumstances, and we support the legislation that would um, provide additional flexibility um, in that regard. Um, uh, but the reality is that one of the reasons you set aspirational goals is to put pressure on the agencies to do better, and then that pressure gets passed on. Um, and not only not only that, do you do you put, have a situation where you may be using firms that that um, that may not be quite up to it, but it also it it makes a problem for the program itself, in my view. Look, change orders. I'm sure every one of you have been frustrated when there's a capital project that gets delayed because there's a change order and then it becomes the blame game. Why isn't my playground finished or, or why isn't my bridge finished or, or whatever, courthouse or whatever it is, and it turns out that there was a change in the scope of work or the, or the soil conditions turned out to be different. I keep and my projects on track. We just did a ribbon cutting yesterday. Yeah, and, and uh, there's a couple of mine that I funded that the NYCHA still hasn't finished. Um, How long ago did you leave uh, office? 17, 18 years, but it's NYCHA. Um, but but the point, the point that I want to make is that, um, that you want to make sure that the goals are right-sized and to the extent that the, that the right-sizing doesn't reflect the overall goal of 30% of or whatever it, it turns out to be or the goals specifically uh, within professional services, that there's a, a level of awareness of that um, so that people don't think that, that it's because of discriminatory practices or because the agencies are incompetent when the fact of the matter is that there just aren't enough engineers in the country, as President Obama pointed out uh, rather eloquently when, uh, when he was in office, and which ACEC uh, attempts to address, and which we'd be happy to discuss with you uh, separately. So a couple of specific things that I wanted to mention. Um, we have a suggestion, it's set forth in our testimony, um, which is that when the agencies are preparing their RFPs, we would hope that they would go into the SBS database. They, which by the way is very granular. It's very gra granular. There's hundreds of codes for different of kinds of, of, of professionals. And let them identify to us the firms that they believe are qualified to do any kind of work on a major capital project so that, that we know where to look and not just to go through the database, which, as you heard earlier, may be miscoded or, or whatever. In other words, a pre-qualified list of certified firms um, that would help um, the majority firms find new partners and not just rely on the ones that they've worked with in the, uh, in the past. Um, the issue of the miscodes was brought to me by GCA, I think, like my first week on the job. Sure. To the extent you and GCA uh, a to the extent ACEC and GCA can find us a handful of examples, um, and I think you heard a willingness from yeah. SBS to be willing to do so. Uh, if the city can do it on our own, I'm open to it. I'm also a big believer in public-private partnerships, so to the extent we could actually do it together, if you know anyone who's willing to do funding beyond their tax dollars, that will yeah. move things quicker. I, I think for the engineers, because it, it is a relatively small universe of people that, that are um, in the database to begin with. And by the way, when we, um, uh, we met with SBS uh, two years ago, I think, to, to try and get our arms around this, one of the things we did right after the meeting was we sent out um, a communication to every member firm saying, if you are qualified to be certified and you're not in the database yet, um, you, need to, uh, you need to do that. And we said to the majority firms that um, you need to go look at the database because there may be some firms that you're not, just not meeting in the ordinary course. So um, uh, I think for us, having uh, pre-qualified firms uh, provided in the RFP would help introduce and give some comfort uh, because the, the engineers are very reluctant to do business with, with folks that they, they don't have complete confidence in. I also, I also want to make a suggestion strictly on my own behalf. I want to make it clear I'm not speaking for ACEC on this, but something that you said earlier, Councilmember, about the MMR, 
which I used to read also, um, uh, registered with me, which is I don't believe that there's a section where they report the waivers. In other words, bef during the RFP process, after the RFP process, even after the contract, the agency can uh, determine that the uh, majority firm made its best efforts, but they just couldn't find anybody and reduce the goals. But I don't know that anybody keeps track of that. And if you did keep track of that, then that could become the basis for um, refining what the goal should be as the database uh, grows. But that's a personal uh, suggestion. Uh, it's in the uh, disparity study. Um, and it was a, an area that we, I didn't ask questions about, but I'm glad you brought it up. So um, if you go to page, give me one second, sorry, because uh, I'm glad to have somebody paying attention to this too. Uh, the waivers are, give me one sec, you can keep testing, fine, I will tell you the page. Uh, well, while you're looking for that, uh, uh, Chair Carlos, um, I, I want to say that um, Generally speaking, the first. Right, hold on, sorry, I found yeah. it. It's on uh, page 2 10 of the study. Uh, it is uh, the full waivers and partial waivers uh, from MOX and uh, from 2007 to 2015. And again, we are four years out from this data, but it was 1,370 waiver requests. Only 264 were denied, only about 22.3%. 403 were fully approved. That has been a trend upwards over time. Uh, and there have been 680 partial waivers. Uh, and so the report notes that uh, many of the waivers were actually awarded to the very same firms. Uh, so it was tracked. And um, I was actually just hopping into the MMR right now to check to see if it's been added as an indicator since your time in the council. but. It was in the disparities report, and if it isn't something that is being, uh, I, I, I look forward to working with you on some legislative work here if necessary, because I have some ideas on how to fix this problem. Let me make it waivers. just a couple but of But thank other you for, if you, would you be willing to submit something supplemental in your own personal capacity? Sure. Thank you. Um, let me just mention two other things uh, briefly that um, uh, on behalf of ACEC, uh, one is that, generally speaking, we uh, support intro uh, 1452, which is, of course, consistent with the notion that the agencies should have as much flexibility as they need to be able to get this right so it doesn't look like they weren't doing their jobs or that the uh, engineering firms uh, weren't. Um, we don't feel the same way about 1379 to require them to hire a third party to come and do the matchmaking for them. We think that that is a solution in search of a problem, um, notwithstanding the fact that the legislation says that the cost is to be borne by the, uh, by the vendor. Um, the reality is all of this work is done for the city, and the cost is going to get passed on to them one way or another. It's just one more regulatory burden on top of the broken procurement system and late payments that they deal with. And quite frankly, whatever money would be involved with that would be better spent on fixing passport, doing outreach, helping firms get certified, and helping them partner with, uh, with majority uh, uh, firms. Um, Under 1379, what is, the, so the car, what is the current process for MWBEs, uh, subcontractors, and primes interacting and getting work, and how would that be changed if a consultant was brought into that equation? Yeah, well, on the second question, we haven't been able to answer that. What the, what the firms do now, and I should start with – by the way, in a minute, you'll hear from the president of ACEC uh, New York for the metro region. I, I will probably do less of a back and forth with them because uh, they, I do not need yeah. to get exact revenge for my tough interview. But, but um, I think the first, uh, the first thing that I would say is that um, we should encourage all of the certified firms to become members of ACEC because it's a great way to interact with the firms that they will be able to, uh, to partner with. In fact, the majority firms should partner with them so that it can meet the 20, 25 percent of the members who are certified. But is, there, is there a fee to join? Oh, you, of course. It's a trade association. But we can talk about. And do you know if the Alliance of uh, New York Asian Architects and Engineers are? Uh, many of this is for individual firms. And many of the firms and many of our board members 
uh, and the leadership of the organization are from the Asian and Southeast Asian uh, community. And it's something that, as I mentioned before, both Let the majority- the record reflect, there's a lot of nods of yes from the audience. Yeah, the, the, that the, you know, that's an important constituency for the, uh, for the organization. By the way, the disparity study um, identifies uh, a Native American uh, firm. I, I thought some of the testimony we heard on that was, was very moving and that there's a disparity. But you know, this came up once before with the state. We've yet to been able to identify a single Native American owned licensed professional engineering company in the state. If there is one and they are added to the category of eligible organizations, you can be sure that they will be kept busy. Um, but if there isn't one, I think it illustrates my point about the importance of, of knowing whether a firm is licensed or, or not. But what, what happens in the real world is that this is something that the firms talk about with their partners all the time, with the agencies. They participate in um, programs that are sponsored. Uh, some of you know Michael Garner, who has been at the MTA and the SCA. He's sort of the gold standard of how you do outreach and how you do matchmaking. A lot of it is comes through just interaction in professional organizations, people meeting on the jobs, working with a different team member. Um, if there are other things that they can be doing that they're not doing, I think all of them would entertain it. But the notion that there's going to be a full employment program for um, MWBE consultants who are going to have to be hired to tell them to do the things that they're already doing, with respectfully, we, d we don't think that that's uh, uh, necessary, and we think that the money could be better spent elsewhere. So in sum, I, I guess what we would say is, is um, we think there has to be a way, and we've been told by council that there's some limitations from state law about breaking out specific licensed professionals, but we think there must be some way in a preface to the legislation, in the committee report or otherwise, to point out that distinction as, as the chair uh, uh, recognized uh, uh, himself. We think that we are, you are entitled to the answer to the question as to whether or not the A and E disparity that the consultant found was limited to licensed firms um, because that would be of benefit for a variety of reasons to uh, for all of us. We think that the agency should have as much oversight as it takes to make sure that they are doing their jobs, but as much flexibility as they need to be able to set the goals that are actually achievable so that you're not setting them up or the engineering firms up uh, for failure. And we look forward to continuing to work with you on these uh, important issues. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Callos and members of the committee. My name is Vicki Arbitrio. Is the light on? It's on. It's on. Am I Bring not it closer to you. Good afternoon. Perfect. Chair Callos and members of the committee, my name is Vicki Arbitrio. I'm a professional engineer and an associate partner at the Structural Engineering and building envelope consulting firm Gil Sands Murray Steffick, headquartered here in New York City. I've been working in the city for 35 years as an engineer and have been a city resident in Speaker Johnson's district for 25 years. I'm here today as the chair of ACEC New York's Metro Region Board of Directors. On behalf of our members, I want to emphasize some of my colleague Ken's points. ACEC New York has a diverse membership. We're reflective of the engineering industry. And as engineers, our members are data-driven and focused on facts. For these reasons, we've consistently asked that the city base the MWBE goals in engineering contracts on data that's accurate and transparent with respect to the number of MWBE firms available to work in our industry. This is the fair, rational, and appropriate way to implement MWBE goals. Unfortunately, for reasons detailed in our testimony, the 2018 disparity studies findings are not accurate nor transparent as they relate to the availability of MWBE firms in the engineering industry. And therefore, intro 1293A, based on this disparity study, is a problem for our industry. I respectfully ask that you closely review the concern detailed in our written testimony we request that the legislation and the committee's report reflect these concerns. 
And additionally, I'd ask your committee to help us in obtaining the 2018 disparity studies underlying data from the city. Thank you, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Carlos and members of the committee on contracts for holding this important hearing to review and hear the testimony on two pieces of crucial legislation, which will greatly improve and expand the New York City MWBE program. My name is Ram Tirumala. I am an owner of Distinct Engineering Solutions, PC, in, uh, based in Manhattan. And uh, I'm testifying as a member of the Alliance of New York Association Architect, Asian Architects and Engineers. For the record, I'm also a member of ACEC and other organizations. Now, in the since passage of Local Law 129, as well as Local Law 1, many Asian businesses, professional engineers, have suffered because of losing the ability to gain um, projects through the set-aside goals of uh, set aside goals. Especially after 2013, it has impacted significantly. I can say for my company, we have our revenues, which went up to 7 million to 2013, dropped to almost 3 million. Now, what is that it has done? It has reduced our ability to use offices in New York, em engage qualified people within this New York City to work for us. And also that has in turn reduced the tax dollars we presented to the city. And one may say, how is that the disparity is affecting? The earlier you were asking a question. Now to me, I may wear a suit, I may wear whatever I want, but when people look at me, they'll immediately say, I'm Asian. So yes, there may not be a clear written disparity to say professionally, but people, the birds of same feather flock together, and that adage is common even hu among the human beings. Now, if you look at, at uh, me and the companies where I worked on our company, what we have done, we have worked on Second Avenue Subway, we have worked on the Subway 7 extension, which Thank were all- Thank you for the Second Avenue Subway, I took it here. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the, some of the important thing that we did as a small business, actually because it's a, it has a DBE program, we were able to participate. We designed and developed a noise containment structure that was in the middle of the road that helped the contractor to work third shift. Initially, people were complaining, Ram, it is going to look bad. But I said it helps in helping people to allow the traffic as well as the contractor could work and every person living in that neighborhood were very happy at the end of the day. Again, I just, it's the second thing I was spent. This, this is what I wanted to sell about my company. It wasn't that loud, except for when they blew things up, in which case <laughs> the whole neighborhood. So we didn't hear the explosion, but the ground shook. <laughs> so that, is thank you. That, that is something we had to live up to <laughs> allow the constructions to happen in the city. I'm sure such vibrations are um, It was just the blasting that upset my cat a great deal. Okay, I can understand that. Next time we'll take care of that too. <laughs> now, the, the reason I'm just trying to say is when I, I read the whole uh, disparity study that came out in 2005, and that study was also not uh, uh, properly done, then the new study also has certain flaws. I'm not here to go over the flaws that the studies have, but the point I'm trying to make it is there is a disparity that exists, and we are very glad at least I would say by the, the new legislation that there will be Asians will be included. And hopefully the, the results may not be seen right away. It may take a year or so for us to see the positive impact, but we're looking forward for the change to come through. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to present my testimony here. I'm gonna ask you a tough question. I'll take you, it may take you a moment to respond. You, you are a member of two organizations. One of the organizations is testifying that the uh, 
percentage for A and E for Asian Americans should be 9.56 versus, I believe, a higher number. Uh, would you like to see the number higher, or would you like to see it lower? You can take a moment to look at their test. Do you have an extra copy of the testimony? From the ACEC? Yes. I, I do not have the copy, but I can answer the question, though. Sure. If you ask me personally, I would say let that whole percentage, whatever 30%, be open to everybody without a division of Asian or black, Hispanic, or anybody, because that way, the reason it is very important is the qualified people, for example, if you are looking for professional engineers, you would find more qualified people maybe among the Asian community. One of the reasons why people have reached out and requested waivers after the 2005 is because there were not that many Asian firms available, uh, sorry, that many uh, MBE certified firms available to provide the services because Asians were not included in that MBE goal. However, if that is the main reason people were forced to ask, I can say from the point of engineering side for request for waivers. But if you keep as a one number, but let qualified people from different ethnic backgrounds be part of it, I think it may give um, a proper just like again, there will be enough pool of people available and it will help less number of waivers to come through. For example, in a construction industry, you may find more blacks and Hispanics. In a professional service, you may find more Asians. Because if you, again, the background is Asians were allowed to enter USA only if they have professional degrees. If you go back the um, US immigration laws, Asians were allowed with professional degrees. That's the reason you will find many doctors, many CPAs, many engineers from Asia, especially India and China. Again, that's another reason why you'll find more professionals. I thought, that Forgive the joke, but uh, as a person who grew up Jewish, I thought it more had to do with our parents than immigration laws, but uh, <laughs> I uh, would, would accept that, that the immigration laws did have an impact on uh, that. So, that, but that's, that's, so do you think that it's, it's a, that experience that a lot of us may have had with our parents is also related to the immigration status in terms of trending folks uh, in different communities towards engineering? I, I would say so. Okay. Like that way, you could see. You also see, like, if you, I'm sure you have seen a lot of uh, TV shows where they stereotype Asians means their children are going for doctors or engineers because the parents themselves are doctors or engineers. Fair enough. I, I am the, I, I am one of the few in my family who didn't go into the medical field. So, in, at least in the stereotypical Jewish family, you can be a, a lawyer, a doctor, or a CPA, and. So I ended up being the lawyer, and now I don't practice law, which takes me even further outside, and I'm doing politics. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Last but not least. Good afternoon, Chairman Kalos, Councilmember Perkins. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Just a few comments uh, before I get into the sudden substance of uh, what we've outlined in our in – our, uh, in our testimony, our written testimony. Uh, one, the Building Contractors Association is located in the Iron Workers Building, and if you're looking for references that potentially may lead you to uh, Native American uh, contacts, the Iron Workers have traditionally been uh, well noted as uh, involved in that specific uh, end of the construction industry, so maybe potentially reaching out to the local uh, may lead you in, in some direction as far as uh, a database of uh, of potential Native American uh, firms. Two, I hope you're still pursuing prevailing wage on the city level. We were very unhappy to see what happened up in Albany. Uh, we've already indicated our, our support for your introduction, and we hope that uh, that uh, uh, sees the light of day. Flattery so, will get you everywhere. Yes, of course. <laughs> Regarding, uh, we're here on a couple of uh, the items that are uh, before you today, specifically and most importantly, 1293A. Uh, we've given you a pretty detailed and lengthy uh, analysis. It is longer than portions of the disparities report. Yes, uh, we wanted to be we very sure that what we're saying in that uh, written testimony is backed up by verifiable information. Basically, in a nutshell, uh, just identifying who we are, the Building Contractors Association is an association of union contractors. Uh, 
both prime and sub, and we have approximately, mm, I think, uh, 42 right now are certified MWBE firms, giving us approximately 21% uh, of our association are uh, certified MWBE firms. We want the certified MWBE firms to succeed, especially in the union construction industry. That takes a lot of extra effort and a lot of extra time and, and uh, uh, again, effort on their behalf because obviously wages are higher, uh, benefit contributions uh, become an issue. So capital uh, capacity building is very important for, for us, our, our members, and hopefully for the future of the MWBE program as it exists. Unfortunately, the proposal as it, uh, as it, is, uh, as it sits here today, uh, the numbers that are, are, are quoted as the proposed aspirational goals, and you'll see uh, in our report here uh, on page two, uh, looking at those numbers just as, uh, as numbers, the increases and the increase in percentage value uh, from where they are now to where they would be, uh, it's, it's substantial, it's huge. Uh, you're talking about uh, cumulative uh, increase in total, uh, total categories up to 67.17% and a cumulative increase of, con of contract value of uh, almost 77%. I think the testimony that we've heard so far today, uh, you know, from the, especially from the SBS and, and MOX, is that they're making incre incremental increases. They're reaching, I think at the, the number was 24% on an industry-wide basis, and I'm here specifically on construction. Uh, I don't know if that 24% was a number that was specific to construction or an overall number, uh, but there's a big difference between 24% uh, and 67.17%. And once those numbers become law, and once those aspirational goals are written into RFPs and contract documents, we're talking about waivers, we just talked about waivers, the number of waivers and the percentage of waivers that are, are approved on a partial or, or a complete basis, that number is gonna explode. It's just not realistic. It just does not reflect reality as it exists currently, right now. There's just not that capacity to meet those aspirational goals. SBS obviously is, is providing you with uh, uh, detailed records. We've quoted those records. Uh, you can see uh, the last quarter's numbers. We see, we see substantial participation, utilization, 59, 64, 36, 41, 56, 59, 76, 38% utilization. Those are, those are big numbers. Right? As it stands right now, if you look, if you can turn to page six, I think one of the most important things to pull out of this disparity study analysis, as far as construction is concerned, is the second full paragraph that I have uh, on page six. The 2018 disparity study states that 94%, 94% of all construction contracts awarded by the city had values at or below a million dollars. That's 94% of all construction contracts. 97% of all MWB contracts were awarded at or below the, the million dollar threshold. And even with the outdated disparity study numbers, you can see here the reference, they, the reference uh, to the disparity studies shows at the $100,000 level, they have 47% utilization from 100 to 200,000, 48% utilization, and between 200 and 1 million have 46% utilization. In addition, whatever, what just happened in Albany with the discretionary threshold number of 500,000, those numbers are gonna increase as, as you could tell from the testimony that you received already. We just don't think there's this reality in, in putting those numbers into the law as they exist, as reality exists right now. The numbers that are, are in the proposed uh, 1293A come out of an estimate of available firms. There's a table in the disparity study. There's a, I reference it in the, in the report here. You can find it in the disparity study. They just took the numbers out of that, out of that document and put it into 1293A, the estimated available firms, and now become the aspirational firms. As you will see, hopefully, if you take a few minutes to read our testimony, the methodology employed in, in, this, in this disparity study analysis, they used a 13 count, county market area 
the estimated availability based on... I, I was disappointed uh, that they excluded Kalamazoo. Uh, well, I, I was surprised uh, that the city of New York does business in Kalamazoo, but... Uh, well, I, I, I can guarantee you that, that SBS is pulling in MWE firms from far beyond the 13-county uh, market area because they are, you know, they're under the mayor's plan, they have to get those numbers up, uh, you know, so there is, you know, you hear conversation, you hear talk about uh, this being, you know, helping city residents as far as, uh, you know, contracts and helping income and income equity, income inequality here in the city, but a lot of these contracts are going to firms from Putnam County, Westchester, New Jersey, Suffolk County, Long Island, right? So it's, it's not has, all city that's uh, benefiting any of these things. $1.6 billion, and uh, what do you call it? Kalamazoo County has one vendor with seven contracts with a value of $35.2 million. I, yeah, I, you know, it's, it is what it is. Uh, so when we talk about the city, and the city getting the benefit of the MWBE program, we have to recognize that this is a 13 market area that the, the uh, MGT looked at when they were uh, putting together this disparity study. Although the, the 13, ca 13 county market area is uh, within the market area of, of what will be allowable uh, New York City certified firms. So there is some match there. But the methodology that they employed to estimate available firms did not take into account that one, there's an existing MWE pro MWBE program uh, in the city, and that two, there are certified firms already. So when you take an estimated number that's gonna be falsely enlarged because it's based on estimates of avail availability and you compare it against actual utilization, which is limited to the certified MWE firms, you're gonna have numbers that look bad, right? That's just how that works, right? So, so I, w I hope that there is some recognition uh, that the Building Contractors Association as representative here along with the GCA and the BTEA who didn't appear but I think will have submitted written testimony. We've always been supportive of the MWBE program. We have MWBE members, we have MWBE board members, we work in cooperation with other trade associations that are subcontractor associations that are special into or, or MWB, minority firm associations. There's nothing here that says we want this program to go away. Absolutely. We want it to stand on constitutional, sound constitutional footing. And when you start pushing numbers up into 70% utilization, you're not talking about remedying uh, uh, you know, underutilization. You're talking, you know, you, you flip the coin now. Now okay. it's an exclusionary so, so, program. So first up, Please give my best to Eddie George. Full disclosure, prior to being in the city council as a union side labor lawyer representing Leuna and the Mason tenders amongst many other laborers throughout the country. Uh, so hear you loud and clear. Uh, I wanna just mention that during this hearing we've had some communication with the administration. Uh, it turns out that my council and I are pretty darn good lawyers and that uh, our, our reading of the legislation that uh, the women is inclusive of all women and not just uh, one particular racial group was correct. Uh, so we have asked for them to send something into the record within the next 72 hours to clarify the legislative intent around the language. If there is something that folks have uh, in terms of specific language that ACEC would like to see and that uh, uh, BCA would like to see and GCA would like to see that takes the number closer to the 54% that was actually in the disparity study, as I had said prior to this panel, to the administration. While I am all about being aspirational and going from 30 to 50, uh, I am not okay with taking it to something that would render this unconstitutional. Uh, around similar grounds, uh, I think that the uh, case law ties our hands a little bit with regards to being tied to the disparity study, but we are now hearing criticism of the disparity study methodologies from both sides, where one side is saying the numbers are inflated, and then we had folks from the Native American community uh, express concern that it was uh, underrepresentative and that the measures that they were using in them, them themselves were discriminatory. 
I initially, when somebody hands me a stack of paper this high, I usually think that it's pretty good disclosure, but you're right. Some of the methodology isn't there. Um, you have not, the ACC has not re received the information. We will send a uh, communication requesting it. So if you can please forward to contracts at bencalos.com your eight previous correspondence. I'm hoping it is one chain of eight emails uh, that we can add our information to. Uh, and we have additional powers as the council, as you may recall, that we can just do document requests, which they must hand us. Um, so I'm interested in seeing the underlying data. Also, there's two pre-considered bills. Uh, one relating to uh, the data, so I think one piece would be uh, if you can submit additional information you might have on how we can say to the city, hey, you can use more up-to-the-date data, you can even build constructs and queries around the data, and then three days before you finalize it, you can just rerun the data a second time just to make sure and, and update the numbers to reflect the, the newer data. Uh, so I want to so I guess um, first is there specific legislative language that uh, uh, BCA and ACEC and GCA will submit uh, to clarify the point on women for both the administration, one of my colleagues, and what have you, or is legislative intent sufficient? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for that opportunity. I, I think we need to give some uh, thought to that. Um, I also want to apologize in advance to the, we may be submitting comments informally because we have a, a hierarchy of committee and board approval and state board approval before we can commit the organization to thing, but we'll work with your staff on that. And secondly, with respect to the information we're looking for, just to save uh, some effort on that, um, attached to our testimony is uh, uh, prior testimony as well as prior correspondence with SVS. I'd call your attention to the last page which contains a letter dated September 12th, uh, 2018, which was around the time that we met with them and asked for this in person. Um, and uh, you'll see on those, in that letter, the specific information that we had requested, which has, uh, in most part, not been provided yet. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm today. sorry I was busy grilling you instead of uh, <laughs> going through your testimony in depth. Uh, so that is helpful. Uh, we'll take whatever legislative language we can. If we're able to get you some of the underlying data, if we're able to change uh, some language so it doesn't appear that it's coming at the 70%, but it's probably closer down to the 50% mark, uh, would that be something where the legislation would still would be supportive enough? Would that, that is something you could live with, especially since we have another disparities study coming out next year? I, I think that... You know, I was giving some thought to that myself as to how do, you, how do, we, how do we incorporate our um, concerns about this into something that is you can vote out of a committee. And I, I, I don't believe that the legislation has a preface um, uh, to it. That might be something that, that you would consider. Certainly the committee report can address it, but that those tend to get lost in, in the shuffle when people turn to the actual legislation. So I think some recognition at a minimum Again, I'm not, I don't fully understand why A&E services can't be broken out. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have follow-up conversation, but I think if there was some recognition in the preamble to the legislation that of some of the types of issues that we've been talking about today, that would empower the agencies and MOCs um, to uh, undertake the authority that they've been given to grant the waivers um, that they can then point to when somebody turns around in the next council and says, why'd you grant all these waivers? Uh, let me ask about the waivers. I was going to ask the administration, but I did not. I wanted to let folks get home by five today. Otherwise, we would have been here all day. So you're bidding on a, a client. Uh, can I walk you through the process? Is it yes, please. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, Pre-development of the RFP, there'll be some interaction see, with the agency and, and the industry. The RFP comes out, it'll have, um, it'll have goals in it. Um, in the course of the uh, quality-based selection where the, uh, uh, the best technical proposal is being identified, there's a give and take with the agency on a whole bunch of things that ultimately re results in those numbers which may be modified 
from the original aspirational 30% goal with the permission of, of Mox. During the course of the contract, as the uh, engineering firm is attempting to satisfy its obligations, they may determine that it's simply not possible, possibly because the firm that they want to work with, that they, that they have confidence in, has been picked up by somebody else and just can't do it because of, of their uh, capacity. So that's a second opportunity for the agency to um, reduce the goals to reflect that reality, provided that the engineering firm or others similarly situated can demonstrate that they actually made a good faith effort to, to, uh, to find somebody else. Even after the contract is completed, uh, because the agencies know what's going on during the course of it, there can be a, a post-completion adjustment, once again saying, we tried our hardest, here's what we did, and we, we just couldn't uh, come up with it. And the agencies, as you pointed out, from the diversity study. So uh, that, that, that is clear in the disparity study. Right. The question I have is, how long is that whole process? Is that days, weeks, months, or years? The answer is it depends on the size of the contract. Uh, but here's the thing that, that keeps me awake at night. Unfortunately, I don't think it actually came to fruition, but someday somebody's going to try this. Uh, there was a contract that the Economic Development Corporation put out where they put in a liquidated damages provision if you didn't meet the goals. And the message that they gave was quite clearly, you can tell us anything you want, but we've now figured out a new revenue source, and we're not likely to grant your waivers because we're going to bang you with, um, we don't want to account to City Hall for why we didn't meet the goal. And by the way, here's another way that we can make money. That came perilously close to a quota. And that's why I think that if we have some recognition of what the reality is that you've heard today, then the, that will give a little bit of a, of, a, of a buffer for the agencies when they do grant the waivers. I hesitate what would have happened if both of us had served on the council together. <laughs> I imagine they would have locked you, me, and Calvin Yeager in a room while we argued and <laughs> people turned off their TVs. But uh, so I guess the question I have is one of the criticisms of the MWB program, not necessarily for engineers, but for in, in, in construction, construction become very, very highly skilled and, and other spaces is uh, that you heard folks may not have the certifications that they ne might need and so on and so forth. But so if you're doing a project and you need, and you need widgets uh, and you go around and there's no NWB that does widgets and you ask for the waiver, if it's a months, two years process during which the contract is happening, is there an opportunity to go to Spacely's uh, sprockets and say to Mr. Spacely and MWBE for the purpose of this fiction, though in the cartoon he was not, uh, you, you make a sprocket, it is very similar to a widget, uh, and go to the folks who are adjacent and say, um, there's a contract, the contract is for real money, and come with SBS and say, we will give you the training, we will pay for that training, we will, pay, we will offer you funding, uh, we will offer you $500,000 loans or whatever it is that costs for widget makers, widget processors, widget what have you, sorry. Yes, widgets. Widgets are the things that Spacely does not make yet. Um, and then if they do that and no one responds or they can't get the widget equipment or the certifications in time, then at that point the waiver is uh, granted versus the current process of we, we couldn't find somebody. So t tell me about why that is a, a good analogy or a bad analogy and also whether or not that would help <coughs> deal with the problem because what the disparity study re report says is that this is it's usually the same firms asking for the same waivers over and over again. So, um, anyone else can answer too. Yeah, I think the answer may be different for the for the contractors um, than it is for the uh, for the engineers. Um, I think what I, and, and happy to take this off. I, I always enjoy talking with you, uh, uh, council member. Um, happy to take this offline. Here's what I think. It can. It, it's going to depend on whether you're de designing a firehouse or a wastewater treatment plant. It's going to depend on whether you're looking for um, somebody to do survey work or uh, RFEI uh, inspection work or whatever the specialty is. Or, um, there, on big projects, you're going to have multiple engineering firms doing different kinds of uh, work, electrical, structural, et cetera. I think that the city um, is, I know that some of the ACOs are looking at um, trying to establish more formal mentorship programs with firms that are not yet qualified. 
uh, uh, so that they can get into the certified program and get work uh, almost immediately. Uh, that's for the administration to, uh, to speak of. Um, I do think that um, there is, there are very, I, I don't think the waiver data that I've seen breaks down at what point in the, in the contract process the waivers are granted, whether it's at the beginning, the middle, or at the end. So I don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm competent to answer your question uh, at this time. If anyone else wants to speak. Yeah, again, uh, this is Ram Tirmala. I just want to say this waiver program, I think uh, based on my experience, we are, we, we, whenever we uh, submit our information, we clearly indicate we are specialized in geotechnical engineering, we specialize in environmental and construction inspections. More than 80% of the times, we request for us to be part of the team to provide services other than that we provide. Now, I can never accept to do something like that, so I always tell them I cannot join the team. So it's very likely people would use that information as a good faith effort. And similarly, I, we do receive a lot of requests from construction firms asking for us to do construction, like when we do the construction inspection for concrete, they will ask us to bid on con concrete placement, which we cannot definitely do. So I had to go and tell them we will not participate. Then they also consider that as good faith effort. So good faith effort, I think, is misused very, very highly. So again, one of the suggestions um, um, that the gentleman just mentioned that maybe if they identify the list of qualified firm for the qualified work, it will definitely help. But I don't know where is, where is a starting point because yes, if somebody wants to spend time and look at the website, like if they look for our company, it clearly identifies what we do, what we specialize in, and what we want to participate in. But again, because I think there is not, a, uh, not enough good checks and balances, this waivers is misused. Can DCA wait because I, I figure you're closer <laughs> to the widgets and sprockets situation. Yeah, given. I mean, I would I would respectfully disagree as far as from the contrast perspective, at least from the prime contractor perspective, that you know there's being a, abuse of the waiver process. There are legitimate reasons why waivers are, are granted. There are legitimate reasons. Uh, most of the firms, the larger firms that we deal with, that are members of our association that contract with the city. Uh, especially on larger contracts, we've seen uh, most of them have uh, MWB compliance officers on staff, either one or two people there on payroll already, and that's all they do all day is make phone calls. L let me get, yeah. let me move from spaces brackets and the analogy just yeah. to reality of labor. So we're at the laborers, and the person comes in and says, "Oh, we we can't use this. This is outside the collective bargaining agreement. Plus, you don't have the training." And I. I can recall a couple of instances where we're like, oh, we don't have the training, do we? And then we go to the training hall and we roll out the program, we get a bunch of workers certified and like the, a week or two later or however long that certification process does, and sometimes that's a bunch of 12 hour days, we come in and we say, we've got these 10 people, they're on the hiring list and you have to take them. And so just how, is that, is there, is that something you've heard of happening? Is there, and is there an opportunity to do that in the same way of like, if somebody says, oh, these people don't exist to be like, okay, let's go out and train. I, I, I would find it probably improbable that someone could be created from nothing in real time while a contract is uh, pending or a project's already in. in I, well, in, in, uh, in the labor construct, it's you're going to your, you go to your, your, your hiring list or the out of work list. You, you go to folks who have similar skill sets and are out of work and construction tends to be a lots of work in the win in, in the summer and lots of training fund in, in the winter and where you could go to folks and say, hey, there's this job coming up. No one has the, yeah. there's a chemical cleanup and uh, you have your, your asbestos certification, you have your ground remediation uh, certificate, but uh, this one type of thing involves water hazards too. No one in the union has that water hazard. We're going to add it to the training thing, and if you get your water hazard, and I don't know if there's a water hazard certificate, I'm just, I know, I know we have asbestos, and I know we have ground remediation because we did super fun cleanup in the laborers. Uh, so like, here's this other thing, and this will get you on this job. 
I mean, it's certainly anything's possible. I mean, uh, you know, if the, I don't think these That's waivers That's the analogy are I was uh, thinking of for the waivers yeah, yeah. of, like, when people say, oh, you can't. These waivers aren't given away, you know, willy-nilly. I mean, yeah. if you go and ask for one, they're going to, there's pushback. Got you know, it. Try it again. Go call again. Call these people. Call them again. Call them again. Call them again. Right? It's, uh, you know, it, you have to show that you've made a good faith effort, and you're going to have to supply email, copies of emails, copies of phone calls, you know, all this data for them to be able to say you've, you've done what you could do to, see, to exhaust to this pool and there's just no one there that makes those widgets, so we'll give you a waiver for those widgets. Okay. Right. Are there, um, have, have, has the public engagement started on the 2020 disparities study that's supposed to come out? Not, not that uh, we're aware of. I haven't um, even heard of it. Yeah. By the way, uh, uh, Council Member, I just want to mention there's a corollary to the waiver issue that I think also particularly affects the Asian and Southeast Asian firms. Because there's so much pressure to meet the goals, um, then you keep going back to these firms for the work that they know how to do, geotech or whatever the case may be. That makes it harder for them to get a shot at the other work. <laughs> so when they start to grow, when they're successful, and when they're able to recruit talent that can do things that they haven't historically done, um, the, it, it, it makes it harder for them to get considered for that new kind of work because the only thing that people are focused on is, is meeting the goals. And I don't have a solution for that problem, but I know that it's something that, that many of our MWB firms have, have expressed to us over, uh, over time. I, I think that the fact that the uh, uh, Alliance of New York Asian Architects and Engineers is back here and that folks, that there became, that once they achieved a sufficient market share to no longer be an MWBE, they stopped getting business and, it, and we ended up in a situation where the discrimination that we're trying to offset continued to exist in the private sector and on city contracts. Uh, I think this is a good band-aid to address a symptom of the discrimination we are seeing in society and in the private sector. But I, I, I would agree with the goals of this under the 14th Amendment, which is trying to create escape velocity so that I, the, the goal of this program would be for the, for the Alliance of New York Asian Architects and Engineers to get back in and then get a sufficient market share and then remain with that market share even after they are no longer considered an MWBE. And like the, and so, so the goal would be to eventually move all of the folks in the MWBEs into a place where they have sufficient market share that they're no longer facing discrimination and uh, where they are, are private sectors representative of the diversity of this great city. So. I want to thank everyone at the table. Our doors are open. If you haven't had a chance to testify, please submit testimony to contracts at bencalos.com. If you haven't had a chance to participate in the online conversation, you can tag me at Ben Kalos on every social media platform. I want to thank everyone for this hearing. I want to thank everyone for coming out. Again, I know how many billable hours everyone just spent to be here. And I see a lot of engineers in the audience for this entire three and a half hour hearing. And I know this is longer than typical hearings, but I really want to appreciate everyone for being here, sharing their personal stories, um, sharing their own uh, financial success and challenges. That is not something folks ever always want to do, but I applaud your courage. And uh, it looks like we have a lot of work to do, and I'm just eager to figure out what are better measures and how we can fix the disparity study moving forward and just take this issue on. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Is there anyone else who has submitted uh, a slip? Seeing none, I hereby adjourn this hearing.